welcome everyone to day two of the ASMFC uh, webinar week. Uh, I'd like to call the uh, Bluefish Management Board uh, meeting to order. Uh, this is uh, a joint meeting uh, with the Bluefish Board and the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, my name is Chris Batsavage. I'm the administrative proxy uh, from North Carolina, uh, serving as a, a board chair. I also uh, serve as one of North Carolina's representatives on the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, with me uh, today is a uh, co-chair sitting to my right, uh, give or take 400 miles away, is uh, Mike Luizzi, uh, chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council, and also up here at the virtual table, uh, maybe not quite as far away as Mike, is uh, uh, Bluefish lead for ASMFC, uh, Dustin Colson leaning and for the Mid-Atlantic Council, Matt Seeley. Uh, the main item on today's agenda is the development of the Bluefish Allocation and Rebuilding Amendment. Uh, there aren't any action items on today's agenda, so I don't anticipate any motions today. Uh, however, um, if the need for a, a motion arises, and since this is a joint meeting, then we'll need a motion and a second from the board and council to debate, to debate the motion, and both the board and council will need to vote in favor of the motion for it to carry. I know, um, uh, all of you are, are familiar with that, but just wanted to make sure that members of the public uh, knew how uh, we, we conduct business during the joint meetings. Okay, um, so uh, move on through the agenda. We'll start with approval of the agenda. Um, are there any, does any board or council members have any modifications to the agenda? If you do, please use the hand raise button. And Chris, just a short interjection here. I'm sorry. Um, we just were hoping to read out a few names of um, commissioners and uh, council members who may be in attendance who haven't accounted for yet. Um, if you don't mind us doing that at some point soon. Um, okay. Actually, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess we'll just uh, just double check, make sure there's no um, uh, no uh, changes to the agenda, and after that, we'll we'll go ahead and do that. So, Tony, does anyone have their hand up for any modifications to the agenda? I do not see any hands raised. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so Dustin, uh, if you wanna go ahead and uh, just uh, check through the names. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and sorry for the interruption before. Um, so looks like we have most of everyone here. Um, so please do just raise your hand so we can notify um, our staff to unmute you if uh, your name is read out. So Stephen Train is not in attendance yesterday, so I don't think he's here today. Uh, we also have Melissa Zabron. Not and then here. We also, okay. Then we also have Senator Ronnie Cromer. And then we have uh, Representative Trey Rhodes. Senator Thad Altman and Bill Orndorff. Aside from those names, everyone else has been accounted for. Yeah, uh, all right, thanks, Dustin. Um, and Matt, do you all have right, uh, a list? Yeah, this or is Matt right. Seeley. I have the list in front of me. Um, I believe for all voting members of the council, I believe that everyone is in attendance. Uh, this is uh, Reverend Thad Altman. I'm also in attendance. Are you able to hear me? We can. We Thank you. Hear you. Thanks, Thad. We do hear you. Great. All right. Uh, yeah. No. Th thanks for just uh, double, double checking on uh, board and council members. Uh, so, um, all right, moving on, um, next is uh, approval of the proceedings from the February uh, board meeting. Uh, are, do any, does anyone have any changes to the, uh, the, the minutes uh, that were included in the briefing materials? Any hands raised for that, Tony? No hands are raised. Okay, all right, well, then we will consider those approved. All right. Um, Next item uh, is to review the public comment summary on the Bluefish Allocation and Rebuilding Amendment Public Information and Scoping Document. Um, 
Dustin and Matt will present a summary of the uh, scope and hearings and comments as well as uh, present information on the FMAT and PDT meeting where they reviewed scoping comments and provided recommendations on the scope of the amendment. So Dustin and Matt, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. I'm just going to get situated here for a second. Everyone can see that okay? The title slide? Yes. All right. All right, well, thanks everybody uh, for joining us on our first stop on our virtual meetings uh, for the joint meetings. And thank you to Tony for uh, checking to make sure everyone was here this morning. I know that's a daunting task given that we have so many people uh, in these joint, joint meetings. Um, so today I'll begin uh, with a recap of the scoping comment summary. Um, first by recapping the amendment goal and our current timeline, followed by a review of the public comment summary. Um, afterwards, Matt will present the FMAT report and then we'll open up the meeting for a board and council discussion on the amendment. And our objective today is to receive guidance on the scope of the amendment so that the FMAT can focus their attention on specific issues for further development. And I just wanna check, is my sound okay? Yes. All right, perfect. All right. So the uh, goal of this amendment is to review and possibly revise the allocation between the commercial and recreational fisheries and commercial allocations to the state. And this action is also needed to rebuild the bluefish stock, avoid overages, and achieve optimum yield, prevent overfishing, and reduce the need for quota transfers. While not a complete timeline, this shows some of the big steps taken thus far uh, in blue, followed by upcoming big steps in the amendment process in green. Uh, as a reminder, the amendment was initiated in December of 2017, and the first round of scoping happened that summer. Most comments received supported status quo or delaying any changes to the FMP until after the MRIP estimates were incorporated into management. The 2019 operational stock assessment indicated that the stock was overfished, and NOAA released the overfish designation in November of last year. This began the two year countdown for when a rebuilding plan must be implemented. And so supplemental scoping was held in February and March of this year. And today we'll be presenting the scoping comment summary. Our hope is that draft management alternatives will be refined in June and approved in August, which will give staff just enough time to develop the public hearing document for approval in December. The goal is to have final action in the spring of 2021 so that the rebuilding plan can be implemented by the spring of 2022. So the supplemental scoping period occurred in February and March and 11 hearings were held from Massachusetts to Florida. Staff recorded a total number of 273 comments received in writing and in person at hearing and the public was asked to comment on five issues that were defined through the first round of scoping, in addition to the new issue of rebuilding the stock. And as a reminder, these issues are the fishery management plan goals and objectives, the commercial and recreational sector allocations, the commercial allocations to the states, uh, transfers, including both the recreational to commercial sector transfers and the commercial state to state transfers, uh, the rebuilding plan, as well as uh, this issue six, other issues, which is used as a placeholder to gather additional information from the public on any management issues that they felt needed to be addressed through this action. So amendment one established the following goals and objectives. In short, the goal is to conserve bluefish along the Atlantic coast, and the objectives include increasing understanding of the stock, providing the highest availability, providing for management cooperation and preventing recruitment overfishing and reducing waste. The majority of comments supported revision of the current FNP goals and objectives and called for inclusion of new considerations. Some of these suggested revisions include accounting for the needs of the bait and snapper fishery, emphasizing the importance of shore-based fishing, 
and encompassing environmental conditions and shifting baselines. There was also a call, call to maximize abundance and the importance of reflecting the value of the bluefish uh, to the recreational fishery in the intrinsic value of a released fish and the importance of catch and release to the fishery. So issue two covers the commercial and recreational allocation and many com comments here supported status quo. As you can see up there on the top of the table, 17 comments received supported status quo. Uh, reasons for status quo included just general disbelief in the new MRIP estimate, a desire to prevent any reductions to the commercial quota, and the reasoning that no change to the allocation should be made as long as the ability to transfer quota between the recreational and commercial sector remains in place in the plan. And then five comments received supported updating the time series and using revised MRIP data to generate new sector allocations. And several of those comments called for the most 10 years of data to be used as the baseline. The most recent 10 years of data to be used as the baseline. Um, in addition, one, organize, uh, one hearing we heard uh, a recommendation that uh, we should consider socioeconomic data to help inform allocation decisions. Um, and this was also followed up in a letter from an organization. And those who spoke in support of catch-based allocation said that a landings-based allocation ignores the catch and release nature of the fishery, and as such uh, should be updated with catch-based allocation. Um, allocation should not ignore the conservation decisions made by thousands of anglers who decide to release uh, to be good stewards of the fishery, was their argument. One second, my screen is frozen. Okay, sorry. Is everyone seeing commercial allocations to the states on the screen? Uh, I had a temporary freeze on my computer. I, I want to make sure it's up to date. Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Had a minor heart attack there, but I'll keep going. <laughs> um, so commercial allocations to the states uh, is issue three, and public opinion was split on this issue. However, the majority of comments in support of status quo uh, were from individuals from southern states. And conversely, the majority of comments supported, supporting updated allocations uh, were received from stakeholders uh, from northern states. Um, several comments desired status quo until at least the stack is rebuilt, and other comments in support of status quo preferred to utilize transfers rather than reallocate quota. Comments in support of reallocation had several reoccurring ideas, those being uh, the base allocation should be on the last 10 years of lending, um, and states that repeatedly underutilized quota should be facing reduction. And third, uh, a lot of people just called for reallocation of quota to the northern states. So issue four covers the quota transfer processes and the public commented on both the recreational to commercial sector transfer as well as the state to state commercial transfers. Public opinion was split on this issue as well um, on allowing transfers from the recreational to the commercial sector. Uh, with slightly more commenting in opposition to the transfer. Those who commented in opposition said that sector transfers increase fishing pressure on the stock and goes against the catch and release nature of the fishery. A few comments were simply asking for no transfers while the stock rebuilds um, and a uh, possible continuation after it's rebuilt to the target. A, suge a suggestion was also made to make sector transfers bio bidirectional to allow greater equity and flexibility within the plan. On the flip side, uh, when looking at commercial state-to-state -state transfers, um, it's a widely popular tool uh, with 14 comments in support of keeping them status quo and only a few comments in opposition. Those who support the transfers often said that they offer flexibility and economic opportunity. Issue five being rebuilding received uh, a good amount of input as well. Uh, there are two viewpoints on rebuilding that seem to come out. Um, 
Some commented that rebuilding should be done as quickly as possible to ensure that the staff recovers. And uh, conversely, um, others felt that a fast rebuilding plan um, should take place and that it should, oh, excuse me. Um, however, the majority in uh, opposition to a, a, a fast rebuilding plan called for uh, rebuilding over 10 years to allow more fishing to occur in the short term and have less drastic changes to management measures. Many people called for more research on the changing environment's effect on the fishery, and they said that environmental protection for bluefish habitat is critical. And others said that better data needed to be um, gathered on population dynamics and distribution uh, for a real thorough understanding of the stock before rebuilding is tackled. And those who doubted the overfish status suggested several possible reasons as to why available abundance has decreased. Um, we heard uh, migration patterns have shifted, uh, they are living further offshore. Uh, several have point, pointed to the cyclical nature of the stock, and others, of course, doubted, doubted the validity of MREP and thought that um, the new estimates were the only reason uh, for the overfish designation when prior um, data had sh been showing that the stock was doing well, or at least above the threshold. Several ind individuals were concerned that drastic changes to measures would turn bluefish into a discard fishery, and stakeholders requested a full suite of rebuilding plans and projections be incorporated into the draft amendment for public comment. Lastly, a few individuals asked why the SSB uh, maximum sustainable yield target proxy was at the level uh, which the fishery had never seen before and wondered if rebuilding to this new target level was even possible. So this graph displays um, the SSB and the solid line over time. And as you can see, it does not cross the top dotted SSB target level going all the way back to 1985. So that was feeling some of the concerns of the people who thought it'd be very challenging to rebuild the stock. However, when we look at the fishing effort, it has been above the threshold throughout the time series with the, uh, with the exception of 2018. And initial projections uh, provided by Tony Wood indicate that, that preventing overfishing should allow the stock to bounce back quickly. There were a large amount of comments received that did not directly pertain to the established amendment issues, and we attempted to categorize them um, based on reoccurring comments here. We received 11 comments on sector separation, which I'll go into greater detail on a later slide. And throughout the scoping process, it was clear that many people don't have faith in the MRIP estimates and the methodology used to produce them. One commenter said that NOAA Fisheries needs to do a better job of outreach about MRIP methods and to stakeholders to increase confidence in the data and at this same hearing in Massachusetts, there was frustration that there is never an MREP representative at public hearings. The vast majority of comments received on bag limits were in favor of increasing the bag limit. Um, most likely a reaction to the, the pretty significant decrease in the bag limit that happened very recently. There were also a large variety of other comments many of them only one or two on a, on a particular concept. Um, and many of them were observations out at sea. I'll display some of the common themes on the next slide. Uh, we had comments on adding a minimum size limit, often um, for the protection of, of the fishery in hopes that it would rebuild quicker. Um, a lot of comments uh, talked about identifying the intrinsic value of fish left in the water, uh, as well as the catch and release aspect of the fishery. A lot of people called for maximizing abundance and addressing discard mortality assumption rates. There are a few comments in regards to looking into ecosystem-based management, something which we could potentially look into incorporating into the FMP goals and objectives. And again, people called for more research on stock dynamics. A few said close the fishery entirely until it is rebuilt. And then we also received a request, request from the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to consider the inclusion of de minimis status for the recreational fishery in the amendment. 
the request is that the board and council consider waiving recreational fishery regulations if a state comprises less than 1% of coastwide harvest. And before we take questions from the board and council on the public comment summary, this slide provides a closer look at the discussion surrounding uh, four higher sector, sector separation. Um, during the public comment period, individuals suggested two ways in which four higher sector separation should be handled. Uh, this could take the form of a sub ACL where the four higher sector is provided its own allocation. And other individuals from the public asked for a four higher what they called an allowance, which would formally develop a policy that continues the use of different management measures for the four hire fleet, but that doesn't involve a specific sector allocation. During scoping, members of the public provided several reasons for adopting a four hire sector separation. Some noted that four hire catch is such a small proportion of overall catch, and thus um, it'd be justifiable to have their own allocation. Others commented that the four hire fleet is better managed and accounted for under a VTR data. And lastly, the four hire sector that relies on a steady bag limit to sell trips may be sheltered from the wild swings and MRF estimates from year to year. And the sector may be better able to maintain consistent recreational managed, uh, measures. Public comments opposed to this idea often stated that four hire sector separation was not fair and equitable to other recreational anglers. And they thought it unfair that some individuals who could afford to pay to go on a charter get a higher bag limit than those who fish from shore or their own boat. Additional recreational measures also creates challenges for enforcement, especially when intercepted at marina. And that wraps up the public comment summary. Uh, people could mute their line. Uh, just for getting a little bit of feedback. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, again, that wraps up the public comment summary. And next, Matt will dive into the FMAT summary and uh, recommendations. And just give us a moment as we transition to sharing Matt's screen. Matt, would you like to request, or I, I guess I can click here and make you presenter if you're ready. Yeah, if you can just go ahead and send it over to me, Dustin, that'd be great. Over to you. Thank and if you. you recall the drop down button below the big um, play symbol uh, allows you to choose which screen you're showing. Okay, do you, so let me see here. Right now we see the beautiful view of the mountains and the uh, <laughs> prayer flags. There you go, perfect. Okay, so you see the, um, the FMAT report here now? Yep, you're all set. Okay, and you can hear me fine? Loud and clear. All right, thanks Dustin for um, giving a, a great view of the scoping comment summary documents and all of the comments that we did receive. So as Dustin and Chris both indicated, I'm gonna go through the FMAT report to give you a, um, try, try to give you a brief summary of what the FMAT was thinking based on all of these comments and going through. Uh, but as a little background here, the FMAT consists of 10 individuals, um, including staff from the Council, GARFO, the Science Center Commission, and the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. And the FMAT last met via webinar on April 13th to discuss the scoping comment summary document and to develop questions and recommendations for council and board discussion. So before I really get going, I just wanna emphasize that we're working on a very stringent timeline here with the goal of having a public hearing document in front of you all at the joint December meeting. And we definitely feel we can meet this deadline if we continue to follow along the timeline that Dustin provided and we make the necessary progress here today, which includes identifying what Matt, we lost you. Matt, are you still there? Matt, if you have a headset on, maybe it stopped working. 
You may want to just pull your headset out and just try your computer. Uh oh, I don't know if he can hear us. I know. Um, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to call him. Squawk him, whatever that chat is you guys use. I don't even know if he's going to notice that. Yeah, one second. I'm just going to. You probably won't notice something on the computer. Someone may set that, that will go through revisions. Screen. Oh, there oh. he goes. Matt, can you hear us? I hear you now. Sorry, did you? you we lost you for about a minute and a half. Oh, wow. Really? really? Um, it was probably because it was going through your phone and your phone lost service or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, you were just talking okay. about how important it was to stay on the timeline and then it went blank. Okay. So sorry about again, that, everyone. If that happens again, I would recommend um, going through computer audio. Um, but hopefully, we'll be all set from here. Okay. Typically, this is the best way for me to go. But if something doesn't work, just interrupt me, and I'll I'll fix that again. Uh, so apologies, everyone. But you can hear me now, Dustin. Yep. Okay. So I, I may backtrack a little bit here. Um, but I, I think it's important. So I, I was talking about the timeline. So I just, I wanted to emphasize that we're working on a very strict timeline with the goal of having a public hearing document in front of you all at the joint December meeting. And we feel, uh, Dustin and I both feel that we can meet this deadline if we continue to follow the timeline we provided and make the necessary progress here today. And that includes identifying which issues to keep within the amendment. So I'm first gonna go through the whole presentation issue by issue, and then I'm gonna to return to each slide that indicates action items need to be addressed. And as Chris Bat Savage indicated earlier on, these action items are mainly points of discussion. We wanna you know, hear what the council and board think. Uh, we don't necessarily need motions to move forward with things, we just need those recommendations. But again, just please keep in mind that the goal here is to identify which issues to include in the amendment and have the FMAT further pursue. So Dustin, just checking in, are you still following along? Yep, still with you. All right, thanks. So the first issue discussed by the FMAT was the fishery management plan, the FMP goals and objectives. Similar to how other FMP amendments have addressed goals and objectives, the FMAT here plans to recommend one alternative in addition to the status quo FMP goals and objectives. And this is intended to be a working set that we'll go through with revisions at each meeting as we continue to discuss alternatives. So since this action item will continue to be a work in progress, I don't plan to dwell on the current proposed language. However, if you have had a chance to review the briefing materials, you may already have suggestions or revisions that we would appreciate hearing once we come back to each of these items. Um, and if, avail if available, the FMAT is requesting input on if there are important aspects of the fishery that are not uh, currently captured by the proposed goals and objectives, if a goal and objective should be removed entirely, or if there's any recommended revisions that you do have. So here, I understand there's a lot of text. Um, this is here mainly for me to come back to if we do decide to dive into things. This is also in the briefing materials, but so I don't really want to dwell on these in detail right now. However, as I indicated in the last slide, if anyone has any additional input, we'd love to hear it when we return to this item. Uh, but just to give you a little bit more detail, we have broken up these goals and objectives into kind of subcategories where the goals here are the overarching aspects we're trying to achieve. The objectives are the steps we can take to ultimately reach our goals. And then the strategies are the approaches we take to meet our objectives and then ultimately our goals. So the second issue are the uh, sector-based allocations. And you all have probably seen this slide before, uh, indicating that the original FMP back in 1990 set the allocations at 80% recreational and 20% commercial of the total ACL. And then that was revised through Amendment 1 in 1999 that set the allocations to be 83% rec and 17% commercial, developed with data from 1981 to 1989. And the table on the bottom here shows a variety of different time series using both the new and the old MRIP data. And if you reference the amendment one column under the old MRIP numbers, you'll see that that's where the 8317 allocation uh, is developed from. 
And if the new MRIC data was used for that same time series, the allocation would be closer to 90% recreational, 10% commercial. And then you can see what the other time series look like when you use the new MRIC numbers as you continue across the table. So under this uh, sector allocation issue, uh, the, the FMED is requesting feedback on a variety of different topics. So if you pay attention to the headings that I have over the next two slides, you'll see they're all related to this issue too, sector allocations, but there's a few different topics within that that, um, that would help you follow along. And if you do have the FMAT summary in front of you, you were essentially following along that table that's available. So we're requesting feedback on which time series should be considered for further development. Um, is there a specific time series that council and board members are more interested in seeing and how can we uh, revise that as we continue to move along? Uh, the FMAT recommendation is to use a time series with a minimum of 10 years. It helps encompass more of the history of what's been going on, the recent history that is within the fishery. And then for the uh, commercial rec split, the FMAT recommends catch base allocation since the fishery is predominantly allocated to the recreational sector, as opposed to the landing space allocations that are currently in, uh, currently in place in Amendment 1. And then to go a little bit further, just because the FMAT is requesting catch base allocations obviously doesn't mean that's the only allocation that needs to be presented. So we'd love some feedback on if the catch and landing space allocation should be further developed. So still under the same issue, uh, the commercial and recreational allocations, but now focusing a little bit more to help us understand how to develop these alternatives, we need to talk about discards. And this is something that's been brought up at previous council and board meetings, uh, where there's two different methods of calculating recreational discards for management use. And the FMAT is now requesting guidance on which approach to use. Um, you know, they feel it's time we really hone in on this and try to understand uh, one solid method. The two different methods that are available are the one used by the Northeast Fishery Science Center where these weighted length data from MRIP, the American Littoral Society tag releases and volunteer English surveys from Connecticut, Rhode Island and New Jersey. And the Science Center method is what's used in the stock assessments. We then have the MRIP method, which is what's used by GARFO for catch accounting. And this is what was also used to set the 2020 to 2021 specifications. Uh, so ultimately, which method should be used in developing those catch base allocations? Uh, the final part of issue two that the FMAT's requesting input on um, are to develop sector allocations. Um, which other options should we potentially consider? There's a few different options that were proposed that have not really been you know, dove into yet. Uh, those being a trigger-based approach. This could look something like where you have a catch up to a specified ABC level using one set of allocation percentages and any additional al allowable catch above the level would be allocated differently between the sectors. There's also socioeconomic approaches we can take. And then we wanted to survey to see if there's any other approaches that the council and board would like us to look into. So transitioning now to the third issue, uh, the commercial allocations to the states. Similarly, you've seen this slide before in Amendment 1 um, in 1999, we developed these allocations from 1981 to 1989 data and trends in state harvest have shifted, especially with annual state to state transfers in recent years. The table on the bottom here, the top row are the current, uh, the top row are the states, the second row are the current allocations that are uh, present due to Amendment 1. And then there's a 10 and a three year time series there for reference. The colors are indicating the average state share that's more than one standard deviation below or above allocation percent in the fishery management plan. So here you can kind of see which states have been using more of their quota through the transfer provisions. And as I move on to the next issue, issue four, you'll see the actual transfers that have occurred and you may note that the states that have been uh, having higher allocations, for example, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, are the states that have been receiving uh, the majority of the transfers as we move forward. So when we return to this, uh, we're going to talk about a few different action items that the FMAT would like input on. 
specifically if there's any input on a time series that should be considered. Again, should both catch and landings-based allocations be further developed? However, the FMAT recommends the use of landings-based allocations here, uh, and that's in part due to the fact that commercial discards are considered negligible in the stock assessment. So transitioning to issue four, but focusing now on just the commercial state-to-state -state transfers, I'll get to the sector-based transfers in a couple slides. But here, the FMAT commented that the state-to-state -state transfers are likely to be used less frequently following successful commercial state, uh, state quota reallocation, but it's still a very useful tool for adaptive management. In the table below, you can see in light gray which states consistently have been receiving quota in the form of a transfer, and in dark gray which states have consistently sent quota to another state. And this is where I was talking about those uh, similarities between uh, the commercial state allocations and these transfers that have been occurring. And it's important to note that uh, the majority of public opinion supports the ability to transfer commercial quota between states. So some action items we're going to need to focus on here that the FMAT is requesting input on. Should this management tool be further developed? If so, how? And you know, do we not want to adjust this provision because it's been a great, um, a great tool that we've been able to use? So now focusing on the sector transfers, uh, this is part of issue four. Um, I really like this table. I know there's a lot of information on here, but since everyone's in front of their computers, we figured it may be a, a good representation here. This table is showing all of the sector-based transfers from the recreational to the commercial fishery since 2000. The red rectangle around the column all the way to the right is there to highlight the percentage of the transfer that is actually used. So as you can see in recent years, the percentage of the transfer used is much lower than what has been utilized further back in the time series. And at times a transfer occurs even when the commercial sector did not land the initial commercial quota. So this indicates that the transfers were not utilized as much as in the years past. However, just because a small percentage of the overall transfer was, was used or was not used does not mean that states that often meet their own commercial quota do not appreciate the allocated percentage increase to their, state, to their specific state quota. So as the sector-based transfer comes across from recreation to commercial, it's divvied up amongst the states. Some of those states may be using more of that extra little bump than others. So just wanted to note that that's definitely still appreciated here. So as we think about the action items we need to address here, uh, the FMAT's requesting guidance on whether additional modifications to the transfer process should be considered. And some of those modifications could include conditions that allow or prevent those transfers. They could invoke a transfer cap that's you know, potentially different than that 10 and a half million pounds that's currently set to be the maximum transfer as the commercial quota. And then we also received a lot of comments from the public on potential bi-directional sector transfers. Right now, we just go from recreational to commercial. There was a lot of input about transferring potentially from commercial to recreational. The next issue we have to cover is related to the rebuilding plan. So the Madison Stevens Act requires that rebuilding plan be initiated by November 2021 for us. That's two years after the notice we received from GARFO. And the FMAT uh, supports removing the rebuilding plan from this amendment because of concerns about rushing the development of alternatives. However, though, after a lot of review internally, staff recommends leaving rebuilding in the amendment for now. There are a lot more efficiencies uh, that staff was able to go through with keeping the development of alternatives together. There's quite a few different overlapping analyses, and then it sets deadlines for us to work through within this amendment. And as I mentioned, we have our timeline set up now that we can definitely achieve. We're going to have a public hearing document in front of you in December as long as we continue to proceed as we have set things today. Um, and then lastly, it's important to note that if we do determine at a later date that the amendment with rebuilding could not be completed by the two-year deadline, staff would then recommend separation of the rebuilding alternatives from the amendment and development of a framework action to rebuild the bluefish stock through a separate action uh, at a later date, but still prior to that two-year deadline. So there's multiple opportunities that we'll have to remove this later down the road if that should be necessary. However, staff recommends that we keep it in thus far. 
So to dive into some of the projections that we have, um, the estimate has selected five different projection ship scenarios to request of the stock assessment scientists at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Uh, the first one is a constant harvest approach of 7,300 metric tons is what our current ABC is. And through some initial reviews of this, uh, we've noted that if these measures stayed exactly the same, the management measures variety of initial assumptions, uh, but that would get us to the estimated SSB, the spawning stock biomass, our target of over 200,000 metric tons. Additional projections that have been requested are a constant fishing mortality that rebuilds the stock within 10 years and seven years, and then also constant harvest strategies that will allow the fishery to rebuild within the 10 year time span, but that allow for the highest catch possible. And then finally, the council has a risk policy that we have to follow. So we are requesting a projection that follows that risk policy, which is a rebuilding strategy that utilizes the P-STAR approach. And this considers the risks of overfishing given the current stock biomass compared to the target biomass. So the action items we need to target here are additional projection scenarios needed. Uh, do we want to review anything else? And then should the rebuilding plan be removed or kept within the amendment? I'm nearing towards the end here as I get into issue six, uh, but there again, there's two main topics that the FMAT focused on. And the first here is sector specific management uncertainty. So as previously discussed, there's no standard across all management groups on how recreational discard projections are estimated. And this leads to very different discard projections. So the FMAT is recommending further development of sector-specific management uncertainty. And I'll have a visual uh, for you in the next slide to kind of hone in on this. But there's no accepted standard on how recreational discard projections are estimated. Therefore, our recreational management uncertainty is high. However, the commercial management uncertainty remains low. So you've seen this flow chart before, and as it stands, any concerns regarding sector-specific management uncertainty may only be addressed by increasing that management uncertainty for both sectors. You can see our ADC equals our ACL here, and then management uncertainty is taken out. So there's no sector-specific aspect of this. And the proposal that's being made here is to shift this flow chart to look something like this, where your ADC still equals your ACL, and then you have your sector split, but each sector split has their own management uncertainty. There's a recreational and a commercial. Uh, and we'd love to see, receive some feedback on this as we move forward. The last issue and topic that we need to talk about um, are related to the for higher sector separation. So this is only needed if the council and board decide that they want separate allocations and separate accountability. If you're only looking for separate measures, that's something that we already have and did not need to include in the amendment. But again, if you're looking for sector separation, the FMAT will need further guidance. So the FMAT noted that an allocation based on a recent time series, uh, which is how we've been doing things in the past, would result in a share of less than 3% to the for higher sector. And there's two major factors that influence the development of the sub ACL for the for higher sector. That would be choosing an appropriate time series and then selecting which data to base allocations on. However, again, we may not need to have separate allocations because we do have these separate measures which have been developed and revised through specifications and will continue to be developed and revised through specs as we need to remain under, uh, try to target our ACLs. So again, the FMAT is requesting feedback on whether this should be further pursued with the understanding that we already have those separate measures uh, for the for hire sector and the ability to change those measures through specs. So remove this, pursue it further. Our allocations, again, can be based on landings and catch or catch. And then the sector allowance, uh, it's beneficial to further develop a policy on how separate measures are developed. Uh, there's different aspects of accountability, et cetera. And then the FMED is concerned about, obviously, the fair and equitable access across user groups. So it's something we need to keep in mind. And now the last slide, um, just next steps and questions. 
as Dustin indicated, you know, we have a timeline set. It's a very strict timeline that we can definitely meet to have our public hearing document prepared by December. Uh, as you can see, you know, the FMAT is going to continue to meet. We'll present draft alternatives in June, refine them in July. Uh, August, we'll present those to you and hopefully approve for a public hearing document and then actually have that document in front of you at the joint December meeting. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the presentation. I believe Dustin and I would first, uh, if it's okay with you, accept questions on the presentation itself first. So thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Dustin and Matt, for the, uh, for the very uh, comprehensive presentation on, uh, on the scope and comments and, and the uh, FMAT uh, re recommendations and, um, and feedback they're seeking. So yeah, I will open it up to the board and council for just questions on uh, Dustin and Matt's uh, presentation. Uh, not looking for any input on specific issues at this time. That'll be coming up after this. So, uh, any anyone have any questions? Um, Chris, I'm going to read the names that I see with hands raised. And of course, if you um, for the commissioners and council members for now, and if you don't hear me call your name, um, you know, please somehow indicate either by speaking up or whatnot, if, if repeatedly I don't call your name. So I have John McMurray, Tony Delernia, Joe um, Semino, Peter Defer, and Adam Nawalski. All right, thanks. Uh, we'll start with uh, John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a question about the catch versus landing-based allocations. Um, and it was mentioned that the catch base captures the catch and release aspect of the recreational fishery. But uh, what exactly does that mean? It, it just captures dead discards or it captures all releases? I can I can take that one. So this is, um, yeah, go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, so in terms of uh, commercial recreational allocations, um, if you base allocations, um, on just landings, you're looking at what um, dividing up the fishery based on what people are taking home with them. Um, but I guess the, the argument from a few commenters uh, was that, you know, the the fishery itself is of greater importance um, to recreational fishermen than it is represented by just a landing space allocation because you have all of those fish uh, that were released. Um, some of those fish die. There's a you know discard mortality ratio. Um, so typically, as is the case with scups being an example, uh, allocation is based on landing uh, plus plus dead discards. And, you know, there is the potential uh, for looking at all discards. However, uh, to my knowledge, that isn't as common practice, but it's it's a, a possibility. Uh, okay, so. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a follow-up? Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so just trying to understand what you said, it's it, it could be landings plus dead discards or landings plus all releases uh, when you're considering different allocation scenarios. I believe so. Um, however, standard practice using SCUP as, as an example looks at um, landings plus dead discards um, and in that sense you know there's if you do a catch-based allocation there's incentive to reduce your dead discards to practice better management uh, better release practices um, such as circle hooks and so on um, which would help reduce that that discard amount um, and uh, be able to you know utilize more of your quota in landings in, instead of dead discards that was useful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think next is uh, Tony Delernia, and I forget who is on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions regarding the uh, release mortality, and I, I may have a follow-up after I receive my answer, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Matt, uh, could you just please review again how the uh, release is calculated by both the fishery science center 
I think we have two uh, methods of, you mentioned two methods of uh, calculating release, or two values that we use. There's a value that's generated by a Northeast Fisheries Science Center, and a second value that's generated by the MRIP process. Can you please review for me what goes into the development of each of those different values? Yeah, Tony, thanks for your question. That is a, a great question, a very important topic for us. Um, and just before I answer that, I, I do believe we have Tony Wood on the line, who is the stock assessment scientist at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. He definitely would be able to speak, obviously, in much more detail than I can about the Science Center method. So Tony Kearns or someone, if there's any way to allow uh, Tony Wood to have a, an open phone line, that would be great if he could address that. And I can definitely while, do that. Do you know if he's listed as Anthony Wood? Did you see I his see yeah. Wood, the listing of names? Okay, I see it. Yeah. yeah. It's done here. Okay, so his so, mic is open. Uh, Tony. Tony, you can speak. So prior to just the Science Center method, uh Tony Delernia, the MRIP approach that we have here is to actually go in and do the simple query that we always do of the B2s. And those B2s are all of the released fish. And then the 15% accepted mortality rate that has been used uh, you know, in the recent history is what we apply to those overall B2s to estimate the uh, recreational dead discards. So that's what we do to uh, look at the MRIP estimates to get the discards and if Tony Wood's line is open, I'm sure he would be happy to explain the Science Center approach. Tony, if, uh, if you're uh, available, yeah, uh, please, please go ahead. He's unmuted, but it sounds like we cannot hear him. Um, he just wrote in the questions box saying he's yeah. trying to speak. So well, while Tony, uh, Tony Wood is trying to get that going, Tony Delernia, the, the information that I do have that I can articulate is that uh, they, they use a variety of different um, like weighted length data to incorporate here. They use some of the MRIP data that's available, the American Littoral Society tag releases, and then they also have volunteer angler surveys from Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. And then I believe they incorporate some seasonality to there as well. And then uh, Tony has a spreadsheet that he uses to generate the discards uh, that, that they actually do use in the stock assessment. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out that uh, using the data that the Northeast Fisheries Science Center uh, process will skew the uh, number of fish that are released. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, the uh, using the American Littoral Society information, that society is one which is devoted to and promotes and is most recognized for the process of catch and release fishing. Their current website uh, lists that there are approximately 1,000 of their members are, are active taggers and that 15,000 tags a year are typically deployed. Uh, so I don't believe that's representative of the bluefish fishery coast the wide. I believe that skews the release data significantly. Also, if I recall from a previous council meeting when there was some discussion regarding the volunteer tagging program, uh, I seem to recur, uh, think that the number of individuals involved in that, in that voluntary tagging program, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Jersey, was low, and uh, uh, if it was so low, I remember thinking to myself that it's probably statistically insignificant. So uh, uh, it's for that reason that I would uh, continue to support using. Although I don't really like MRIP, I believe of the of the two processes, I believe the the MRIP data is less. Uh, biased in uh, coming up with a, a release post release mortality thank you and i'll i'll unmute um, i'll mute myself unless there's any questions thank you 
Yeah, thanks, Tony. And, and we will certainly uh, talk a little bit more about that, um, <clears throat> as well as the other action items uh, that um, that the FMAT is looking for um, <clears throat> from from us today. So, uh, uh, Tony, currently, uh, we have next for, on the queue. Yep. Um, Tony Wood is, I think we have Tony Wood connected. And Tony Delernia, your mic is not muted, just to let you know. There you go. Tony. Wood, are you there? We still I think have Tony's here, Tony Wood. Yeah. Um, so this is Katie Drew, the commission scientist who works on the bluefish assessment. Um, can I just make a, a comment in response to that question real quick? Uh, yeah, real quick. And uh, and I think in the interest of time after this, Katie, if uh, if, if we can connect with Tony Wood um we can uh, he can chime in later when we come back to that but yeah katie please please go ahead right now so i just wanted to make sure that people understood the difference between what the science center is doing and garfo is doing is not about the total numbers of fish released it's about how you translate that numbers into the weight of fish and so the volunteer angler programs and the littoral society data are strictly going in to help calculate what's the average size of a fish released and we're using the total numbers and the discard mortality same discard mortality rate that garfo is using rather than trying to calculate a new set of numbers but uh, because MREP has very limited sample size data on the size of fish that are released, and we know that the size of fish that are released are different than the size of fish harvested, we use a wider range of data to get a better average size. Although we do recognize that, of course, the people who are filling out those volunteer angler logbook surveys and the littoral society tagging programs are maybe not as representative of the whole population in terms of the size that they of fish that they released. But it's not about coming up with a new number of fish that are released least yeah uh, thanks katie that's a important point to, for, for all of us to, to understand on, on those two methodologies uh tony Kearns, who, who do we have next on the queue we have joe Semino, then peter defer adam nawalski and then justin davis okay uh joe Semino, uh you're up <clears throat> thanks mr chair <clears throat> and thanks matt and dustin i have plenty of comments which i'll hold the only well, one question I have right now is uh, commercial transfers, and, and maybe this goes to Matt. Is there um, is there a deadline, a time deadline on on when that stops? So if a state just went over slightly and they didn't realize it till the uh, end of 2019 or, or January of 2020, would they be able to request from a state that still had quota, sort of a you know, a paper exercise in January or February of the following year to to do a transfer, or or does it not even matter? Yeah, thanks for that question, Joe. That's a that's a great question. I uh, unfortunately, since I'm not uh, the one that facilitates those transfers, that I believe that would be Garfo and then the state agencies. That someone else may be um, better you know, well versed to answer that question. So I don't know if. Cynthia Ferrio with Garfo would be able to tackle that, or maybe Mike Ruccio? Yeah, um, yeah, thanks. If uh, yeah, uh, someone from Garfo can um, answer that question for Joe Semino, if they can. I know, um, yeah, being a federally managed uh, uh, species, uh, there there's some restrictions on when quota transfers can happen, usually December 15th cutoff, but uh, I'll see if someone from Garfo can provide some more information on that. Mike Pitney has his hand raised to do so, I believe. Okay, Mike. Yeah, thanks, um, Chairman. Yeah, I mean, you you just uh, stated the date. It's December fifteenth. Every year, um, we get a letter out to all of the states, uh, reminding you that, um, reminding everyone, um, any in-season transfers of quota for either bluefish or summer flounder. Uh, should be submitted to us by December 15th, which ensures that we can get the transfer um, in place by the end of the calendar year. The the one accommodation we have for kind of late season or or uh, after the fishing year transfers um, is is for <clears throat> any unexpected um, situations, um, you know, for vessel safety uh, or or harbor uh, safety. So. We often get some um, 
you know, end of December, a vessel can't land in Carolina, so it's in Virginia, and we get a request for a for a safe harbor type transfer. Um, those we we authorize after the end of the year, but uh, for simple quota management purposes, uh, December fifteenth is the deadline. Yeah, th thanks for that, Mike. Uh, Joe, did you have a follow up on that, or, or are you good? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Um, who do we have up next? And I just uh, I guess want to uh, remind folks that um, uh, I guess if your questions. You think about your, the questions you want to ask about the presentation now, um, then definitely feel free to do that. We'll take a few more. If your questions are probably better suited for providing input to the FMAT, I uh, ask that you hold those uh, uh, so we allow um, allow enough time to give uh, give Matt and Dustin the uh, the input they need to go back uh, to FMAT. So, um, so Tony, who do we have next on the queue? We have um, Peter Defer. Adam Nowalski and Justin Davis and Matt Seeley, just a reminder to mute your um, phone when you're not talking. Thanks, Tony. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Matt. Matt, you uh, mentioned that I think the FMAT or maybe staff recommended including the rebuilding plan in this amendment action, if I understood that correctly. And could you explain um, what what the advantage to that is and why go through that administrative direction as opposed to a different one? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that Pete, uh, that question, Peter. It's um, you kind of brought up part of it that makes you know great sense too is the administrative direction. Um, you know, there's there's potentially no need to remove the rebuilding plan from the amendment and put that administrative burden um, out there right now because the way that the rebuilding plan is set up is to be initiated when this amendment should be going into uh, its conclusion. So the timeline is set up perfectly right now where things are gonna be flowing along. On top of that, there's analyses that are going to be conducted that are somewhat overlapping between what is necessary for the rebuilding plan and the rest of the issues within the amendment. And then even further, you know, this um, uh, aspect of the rebuilding plan can be removed from the amendment at any point that we feel, you know, we may not hit this deadline or this needs to be targeted in a different way. And then that can be addressed through some other action that the council can uptake, you know, maybe a framework action or something like that uh, to be completed within that same timeline. But again, just to reiterate the fact that the timeline that we have set up thus far includes the rebuilding plan being implemented within the deadlines that we are uh, have to abide by due to what Magnuson says. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that that was the staff's recommendation. Um, the FMAT's recommendation did differ, um, and they thought it should be broken out to allow more time for uh, development of amendment um, act, uh, alternatives. Um, but yeah, just wanted to make that distinction. And thanks. Um, Next up is uh, Adam Nowalski. Good morning, thank you very much. Uh, early in the presentation, there was a slide that offered feedback from the public during scoping about a uh, number of comments received in favor of commercial allocation increasing, commercial allocation decreasing, rec allocation increasing, and rec allocation decreasing. What I noticed is that the number, I would have expected that people that were in favor of one sector or the other have an increasing allocation would have uh, translated to a similar comment related to the allocation decreasing for the other sector. So what I'm wondering here is that when people offered input about an increase for one sector allocation to the other where were they recommending that allocation come from if it wasn't related to a decrease in the other sector allocation and vice versa yeah, Adam, do you want I me to tackle first, this one i can take a first stab at it um 
So it's, it's sometimes challenging to place comments into specific categories. Matt and I did discuss um, the kind of, in a way, it seems like um, having four categories looking at increasing and decreasing each sector is, is kind of duplicative. But um, a lot of comments that we grouped into these categories were often saying, like, the recreational sector needs more allocation for this, this, and this reason. And I, I don't believe, at least in uh, some of the comments, that they were necessarily saying that the commercial sector should see a decrease while the recreational sector sees an increase. A lot of comments were just kind of calling for a liberation of, of um, eight, uh, landing uh, for their particular sector. Some of that may stem from just a, a misunderstanding on how allocations are done. It, the fact that it is like a zero sum game. Um, so we, we went back and forth on how to display this information, but we thought with a lot of comments, specifically only addressing a need for an increase or greater access within a specific fishery that we, we should group it this way. Uh, I don't know if Matt, you can expand upon that. And I, I think all oh, I was looking for is, was there a piece of information we as managers needed to have from this process whereby if a comment advocated for an increase in one side but not necessarily a decrease in the other, was there a recommendation that went along with these for some other allocation mechanism, or if there was a decrease in an allocation, uh, that that should, whatever wasn't utilized should be left for conservation benefit or something else. I think that's what I'm most interested in knowing uh, in understanding how to interpret these comments. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't know, Matt, uh, yeah, pr probably won't have uh, a real answer for that. And yeah, it was, yeah, kind of hard to figure, but I think uh, yeah, we'll have to work through that. Uh, next up Can is uh, Dustin Davis. Uh, who was that? All right, uh, we'll go with Dustin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matt, I was wondering if you could put up the slide again that had the different projections to inform the rebuilding plan? Right, so I'm um, hoping you could talk a little bit about the difference between a constant F and a constant harvest strategy and how that intersects with the specification setting process and the degree to which either of those strategies are informed by stock assessment updates that might come during the 10-year rebuilding plan. And also, and I haven't been through this process before with implementation of one of these 10-year rebuilding plans, is the idea that at the onset of the rebuilding plan, you decide on a certain strategy for the rebuilding plan, and then that strategy remains fixed for the entire 10 years? Or do you have the ability to adjust course during the 10-year period depending on how the stock is responding. Yeah, thanks for that question, Justin. Um, I'm going to try to tackle that as best as I can. Um, I obviously haven't been through one of these rebuilding plans yet either, so I'm going to look to some of my colleagues here who have experienced that uh, for some support as we go through, whether that's Garfo or uh, any other council staff or state directors that have experience here. But um, so. Yeah, the constant F, um, that is relating to obviously the fishing mortality. So keeping, keeping certain levels of fishing consistent over the time series to see what the ABC would be over 10 years. And, you know, we have the same thing there for seven years. And my understanding is that, you know, we continue to go through the spec cycle as normal while trying to follow along with this rebuilding plan. The SSC and the advisory panel and monitoring committee will also go through their same processes where they review the specs and things get adjusted over time. But these rebuilding plans are set just to show you what the, the tentative plan would be for how things will change over time. And, you know, it's reviewed each year and the specs are set every couple of years. 
while that review process is going. And this is all while trying to follow along with this 10 or seven or however many year rebuilding plan that's actually set. Um, so I think that kind of answers one of your questions. And I'm again, going to look to anyone else if anyone can um, kind of bolster that. And then I believe the difference here between the constant F versus the constant harvest would be uh, the, the, the ABC here. So, you know, fishing mortality may be uh, at the same level, but if our spawning stock biomass is different, that pressure is going to change according to what our SSB is like, whereas constant harvest would be, you know, trying to maintain the same harvest level across the entire rebuilding plan. So having that catch be essentially as high as possible each year over 10 years. And this is mainly like a, as a reference point for us to try to understand where these rebuilding projections are looking. And we actually, we don't have these rebuilding projections yet at our disposal. They're still being developed and the projections are being run by the Science Center. So at the next FMAT meeting, uh, if you want to listen in or you can see the report, all of that information will be presented back to the council and board uh, with the actual um, parameters and information that we need under each plan. Uh, so that's, you know, that's pretty much what I got for you here. If anyone else wants to add to that, I'd appreciate any uh, additional support. Does any, anyone else have anything to add um, on, you know, to, to what Matt just said? Okay, if not, uh, Tony, uh, any, anyone else in the queue for questions? You do not have anyone else in the queue. Adam, your hand is still up. I just want to make sure that you're, if you didn't need, yep, you, he put it down. So we're good to go for Adam. Um, so there are no other commissioners with their hands raised. Um, during the presentation, there was a member of the public that reached out that said that they wanted to comment. I don't know if you want to wait to take public comment until later, Chris, or if you plan on taking comment. At some point later. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to wait until the end because I know that uh, uh, we have to work through these these items. But I'll definitely try to set some time aside at the end for for uh, public comment. Um, so uh, so now uh, Dustin and Matt will go back through the presentation to the slides. I have uh, the items in red, so the council and board can address all the FMAT questions and recommendations that will eventually help guide the development of the alternatives. So. Uh, yeah, Dustin and Matt, uh, uh, for, the floor is yours again. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Dustin, if you want, I can just tackle this first one and then we can uh, just go along and, you know, see how this goes. But um, so the first issue uh, are obviously the FMP goals and objectives. These, this is the action item slide. Um, as I, you know, go through this, I'm just going to leave this slide up there for those of you that haven't had a chance to reference it yet. And as I mentioned, we don't really want to dwell on this because the way that we plan on doing the, and when I say we, I'm referring to the FMAT, uh, the way that the FMAT is planning on proposing these options, they're not even alternatives, is by having the status quo uh, FMP goals and objectives and then one set of revised goals and objectives. So just to spend, you know, maybe a minute or two here, I know we have a lot to get through. Uh, we're curious if there's any initial thoughts on any important aspects of the fishery that are not currently captured by these proposed goals and objectives? Do you think there's a goal or objective that should be removed entirely or are there any recommended revisions? So I, I just recommend, you know, Chris, if we can leave this up for a couple seconds, see if anyone has any thoughts. If not, we can move on and this will be addressed again uh, as we talk about alternatives. All right, yeah, we, we could do that. Uh, any any input from the board and council on the proposed goals and objectives? Right now I see one, two hands raised, John McMurray and Adam Nowalski. Uh, John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, regarding uh, the first goal, Ensure the biological sustainability of the bluefish resource in order to maintain a sustainable bluefish fishery, achieve and maintain a sustainable spawning stock biomass rate of fishing mortality, and then B is promote catch and release within the recreational fishery. And I'm I'm trying to understand why that's in there. Um, I mean, of course, it's already a, a primarily a release fishery, somewhere upwards of 70%, I think, 
Um, and I think, I think the intent is to try and communicate uh, the importance of the release fishery, uh, how it's economically, and I think you use the word in, intrinsically important, but I don't think it does that very well. And I'm just uh, wondering what the thought process was for including that and what the reason for including it was. Thanks for I that, John. So I think, uh, go ahead, Dustin. Go ahead, Matt. No. <laughs> um, I was just saying that I think we got a lot of comments um, from public scoping um, about the importance of, of released fish. And I think just the continuation of, you know, promoting circle hooks or anything we can do to keep discard mortality down, um, as well as the the concept of maybe a catch-based allocation. These are, these are all things that can promote catch and release within the recreational fishery. And I think that's why it was included since it seemed to be a reoccurring theme. Okay, that makes sense. Um, uh, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but presumably we're gonna have a chance to to tweak these. Uh, I certainly don't wanna get into wordsmithing right now, but that's that's the intent, right? Yes. We'll be revisiting these as well as the FMAT. This is just kind of a first take, and you know, if there's anything that's a big theme that needs to be changed or something we completely left out, that's what we're looking for here. But um, we'll, we'll continue working on wordsmithing as we move forward through the process. All right, thanks. Adam Nowalski. Thank you. So, following in that same theme, uh, on this proposed strategy 1.2, uh, I would recommend that 1.2 be modified, specifically referencing promoting reduction in discards in the catch and release, unless it is the intent of the FMAT that the goal and strategy should be to promote catch and release. If the latter is in fact the case, I would ask that the FMAT come back to the management bodies with some examples of some other fisheries under management where some similar goal is being utilized uh, to help inform us that that's the direction that we intend to go. Uh, my preference is not to have this as a goal that we're specifically promoting it, but again, I'm willing to consider it if there's some sound rationale presented why. If it is, in fact, the intention to focus more on minimizing discards, making that catch and release aspect of the fishery uh, more responsible relative to resource health, uh, then I would definitely encourage work on modifying it as such. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Adam. Um, any other Comments, questions, input on from uh, the board and council on the proposed FMP goals and objectives. I have um, Jason McNamee, Phil Langley, Eric Reed, and Tom Fody, and then John McMurray. Again, Jason and Phil had their hands up and took them down. I don't know if it was by accident or not. Okay, uh, so I think memory serves me. Next is uh, Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, if we're going to promote catch and release within a recreational fishery, um, we have to minimize dead discards. Uh, I'm, I'm following on Adam's point, I guess, but you know, if that language is going to remain, we have to do something to minimize dead discards in a catch and release fishery if we're going to promote that. So I, I don't see that in here anywhere. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you, that's Eric. a great uh, point, Eric. This is uh, Chris. I just want to emphasize. Yeah, that um, you guys are hitting on a great point. This is kind of the feedback that we're looking for here, where you know we're not wordsmithing anything right now, but you're giving us these suggestions on how we can revise this language as we continue to move forward. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for that clarification, Matt. Yeah, I mean, really, it's key today to, to make sure we provide the input that uh, that the FMAT needs. So. Uh, Making sure we're on the right track. Confirm we're on the right track is uh, is definitely helpful uh, at this stage. Uh, next up is Tom Fody. Tom, we're having trouble hearing you. 
Okay, can you am I hearing better now? It's very distant. You're better now though. Yeah, I, I changed my microphone one plug to another. I guess it hurt. Hold on for one second. Is that better? Much. Yes, better. Okay. I'm sorry, I put it on a different plug and it was work wasn't working as well. Um, basically, what I'm saying is we're not in the job of promoting catch and release fisheries. We're basically in the, in the position of telling people if they're going to catch and release, they need to be, do it in the best manner that's available. And I think that's what that as at one point two should be changed to, because we're in the business of pe people allowing people to fish and how they what they do with their fish is up to them but we should be telling them if you're going to do just catch and release you better do it in the way that's most causes the most at least damage to the fishery yeah that, thanks tom i uh, appreciate those comments um tony anyone else in the queue for for uh, proposed goals and objectives uh john mcmurray oh yeah sorry uh john mcmurray no that's okay i put my hand down and then put it back up i I would just, instead of beating a dead horse, FMAT really needs to clarify what promoting catch and release within the recreational fishery means. And I, I think a good explanation was was provided to me. Um, it, it just needs to, to go in this document somehow. Uh, and, and I'm certainly not opposed to minimizing discard mortality as being part of that, but that doesn't appear like that was the, the the meaning behind this or the thrust behind this. So so it just needs further clarification. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Um, okay, if there aren't any more questions and input, uh, Matt and Dustin, did you get what you needed for uh, for the goals and objectives this year? Yeah, that's a good start, and we'll yeah, that continue was to revise. Okay, and and this is a reminder of the, we'll we'll get another bite off the apple of for, for the goals and objectives as when when it, we have this come back to us, right? Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah, so, there will uh, yeah, be a few more opportunities. Chris. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I think that's important to know that yeah, you know, it's you know, times of the essence, but we're not you know this isn't all set in stone today, so. Uh, yeah, so if you want to move on to the action items for issue two, please. Chris Savage, just really quick. I just want to make sure Phil Langley didn't want to speak. He had his hand up. It went down. It went back up again. It went back down again. So I just am, I wasn't sure if there was trouble with the hand raising button for him or not. Okay, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll quickly that, circle back to Phil Langley then. Phil? Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Ted. Journey. But now I took it back then. It kind of touched base uh, already on what I was going to discuss, and that was with the use of uh, circle hooks in the catch and release fishery. Uh, but I think we've got time to, uh, you know, dig deeper into that as we move forward. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bill. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Matt and Dustin, we'll move on to issue two action items, please. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, so here, uh, we're just looking for, um, we'll start off with um, direction on what types of time sh series should be considered for further development. Uh, for, we've received some guidance from the FMAT on a suggestion of looking at um, time series that are of 10 years or greater just to account for the cyclical nature of the stock. Um, but what types of analyses are um, board members and council members interested in? Are we looking at, you know, three different approaches where we look at something recent, something over a long time period, or or something more just like updating the old um, base years? Um, so we'll start with that. Okay, thanks. Uh, any uh... Any input from the board and council on the commercial and recreational allocation issue? Okay, we have um, Jason, Mac Jason McMe, Tom Fody, and Joe Semino. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Jason McMe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I had a question um, 
about, well, I'll make it as a question slash comment. So um, I take the recommendations of the FMAT in high regard. And in this one, I, I'm struggling a little bit. So I see that they recommend a minimum of 10 year time series. However, given that the majority of this fishery is recreational, and we only have a couple of years where, where they did the calibration experiment where we actually have the data is calibrated on actual side-by-side -side, uh, comparisons of the old method and the new method for MREP. I was thinking that a sh that shorter five-year time period might be a little bit better because there's more um, more of the, I guess, empirical information between the two rather than just the straight calibration um, if you extend that time period out. So, you know, so that's my comment. And, and the question is, did the FMAT discuss that aspect of this at all? Or is this more based on the variability? And so the, the normal concept is with you know, the, the more years you you lump in, the more it kind of tamps down the year to year variability. Yeah, Matt and Dustin, you have any uh any did FMET talk about is that that point at all? Yeah, the main consideration there was the year to year variability. You know, five years is is still a decent amount of time. The point that you brought up is is a good one, and and that wasn't brought up, so that's an important consideration, and we can look into a more recent time series. Um, so appreciate that. If I could follow up, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, go ahead. So um, I know all, all we're doing at this point is trying to sort of hone in um, a little bit uh, to refine the, the number of options. And so um, I think it's fair to leave in the 10 year um, and I would prefer the five-year stay in, and if, um, you know, if there was a desire to, I think dropping the longer time period, I, I'd be okay um, with that. Um, and then just a, a final comment is um, on the catch versus landings. I, I like the idea of, of you know, adding in the catch base, uh, I guess my recommendation at this point would be to leave both versions in the landings because that's kind of a more typical approach. Um, but given the focus on catch and release that we just had a, a couple minutes ago, um, I like the idea of having the catch in there, catch based as well. So my recommendation is to leave them both. Uh, th thanks, Jay. Um, next up is Tom Foddy. Yeah, i not surprised and I don't agree with Dustin because I was around when we started putting the bluefish plan in, in in the late 80s. And at that point, we had a fishery that didn't have recreational or commercial restrictions on it. We just amount of fish being caught. When we put started putting the um, the regulations in 95, it affected the catch figures because we put a 10 fish bag limit on the recreation and we confined the commercial to quotas. Then as we went on, we transferred quotas to allow a bigger catch by the, by the commercial sector. So the only real base years that you have that basically looked at an unrestricted fishery is way back when. It is also interesting that when we put the regulations in place, and if you look at the numbers that you, the chart you put up earlier, Back in the 80s, we had these great numbers until 1989 when we started talking about what we were going to put in. And also, you see that this, the fishery started going down, down, down dramatically in the numbers of fish. So it wasn't fishing pressure that was pushing it. There was some other reason why they sick, were the cyclical or the amount of forage species available, the, the stock started crashing. So I'm looking at the 30 year, you know, the 38 year the table you just put up. And that surely reflects what it was without. Because remember, when we first put the thing, it was a 10 fish blue fish limit in until 2000, and I think it's three or four, when we allowed the states to go, states that wanted to go to a 15. So you basically restricted the recreational catch, and then you started transferring 
unused recreational quota to increase the commercial ca catch. So anyway, I just figured I'd get that on the record because uh, I always looked at, I always kid Jim McHugh when he, when he put the 10 fish bag limit in and then the fish started going the opposite direction. I said, see what happens when you put regulations on the fishery, you start collapsing it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, next up is uh, Jerusalemina. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, to speak to the slide, I, I do have some concern with the catch based, so I, I would like to see uh, both continue to be developed, although I'll go on record right now as saying that I, I have, I, I wouldn't want to leave this meeting w without hearing anything other than this needs to be decoupled um, from from the rebuilding plan, which needs obviously needs to move forward, and we need to spend more time on this. I mean, this is a very tough decision. The majority of people are talking status quo. Um, we are we're proceeding with two other species, or three really, that are looking at this, that are pursuing a whole host of different options, and I think really we should be walking the bluefish discussion on commercial and rec along with summer flounder scup and sea bass instead. Thank you. Yeah, th th thanks, Jeff. Uh, Tony, any more uh, uh, board and council members with uh, input on, on this uh, issue? Yep, we have Mike Luisi here. Okay, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, to that point that Joe just made, you know, I, you know, I'm just wondering how this fits in with the commercial recreational allocation issues that we're dealing with, um, what we're going to deal with after lunch today. And I just, I, I wanted to put it out there, maybe get your thoughts, maybe staff's thoughts about how we could, I don't know, bring bring all of this together. I, you know, I, I do have concerns that we're going to find ourselves in a place where. We're going to be dealing with allocation issues differently between species and i would prefer you know a kind of a standard approach if we're going to make adjustments but you know i just joe just mentioned it i wanted to put it out there as you know maybe get your thoughts um i, I don't have the luxury of sitting next to you uh, and whispering this to you um while we're you know can, while we're going through the meeting today but maybe your thoughts about how this this commercial recreational allocation issue kind of couples with, you know, the other species that we're dealing with uh, as a joint body and, you know, maybe just put it out there to get some feedback on that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Now, I think, I think it's, a, it's an important point and, uh, and I want to, I think I thought, I know I thought of and probably others as well is, uh, you know, is we have the same issue for summer flounder scup and black sea bass and, uh, you know, the, the, the question is, is it appropriate to have um, different options or strategies uh, for addressing the commercial allocate, commercial and recreational allocations for bluefish compared to summer flounder, scut and black sea bass, or should they be more aligned? Um, so yeah, I think any any thoughts from uh, the board and council on on that, um, you know, to provide the FMAT at this point, I think would be really helpful. So, um, yeah, uh, any anyone uh, have any uh, any thoughts on 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 that? Chris, this is Matt Seely. May I just add something here? Uh, yes. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so, just to emphasize again, you know, I, I want to really bring into play the timeline that we're working with here. We have a very very strict timeline where following along with it as you know as necessary the fmat already has meetings set up uh, as we continue to move along with goals and sub goals at each point to have all our all of our alternatives ready which encompasses all of the necessary action and review and analyses necessary to come up with those alternatives so you know keeping in mind the fact that we do have this timeline that rebuilding fits within it and that these alternatives are going to be developed following along with that um, you know, the FMET feels comfortable knowing that we can proceed as is. So I just want to emphasize that and make everyone, you know, comfortable that staff is okay with the associated work that's coming along with this. So thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, any any other uh, input 
from the board and council on issue two. You have Tony Delarnia. Yeah, thanks, Tony Delarnia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I support what Matt just said. I, uh, I agree with them there. Also, I'd like to point out to uh, something that Chairman Luisi just brought up. I understand the need to try to be consistent across all the fisheries. But when you look at the bluefish fishery, the percentage division between the commercial and recreational is significantly greater than the uh, percentage distributions of some of the scup and black sea bass. And so while for those uh, fisheries, I could see developing a single policy, with, as far as the bluefish is concerned, because there's such a large difference in the percentage allocations, I believe it would be uh, appropriate to have a, perhaps a slightly different policy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, appreciate that that comment. And I think, yeah, it's going to be, you know, how kind of how we have to look at this is, um, you know, if if we do go a different route, uh, a different route from summer finer scut and black sea bass, why is that? What are the differences? And, and you just you know, men mentioned one uh, compared to the other three species. Uh, any any other council and board members with uh, input on issue two? I do not see any other hands raised. Okay, um, let's see, Matt and Dustin, uh, let's see, you still need some input on the discard aspect of this, right? Yeah, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. We, um, you know, we still have two other slides that are related to issue two. However, they're, you know, it's still just general input, con you know, following along this process that will affect each issue. Um, so yeah, Dustin, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. So you got it, Matt. Um, just some guidance, if, if possible, on on which, since we've received some interest in developing catch space al allocations along with landing space allocations, some guidance on uh, which method should be used uh, for calculating the dead discards uh, would be appreciated. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and um, and it was uh, you know question asked uh, about this earlier, and you know we did discuss this pretty uh, thoroughly uh, at, at the October meeting and, uh, and I think Tony Delernia um, uh, accurately described uh, some of the issues uh, with, with the, uh, the, the two different or methods in terms of you know, uh, you know who, who's tagging or who's collecting the fish uh, uh, where, where the fish are coming from because yeah, one, one issue is you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the volunteer angler survey and ALS data doesn't cover the entire range of, of bluefish and um, you know, larger bluefish are found in the northern end of the range where the data is being collected versus the southern. Uh, the Emmerich method um, you know, assumes that all the release fish are the same exact size as the catch fish, which uh, you know, there, there's evidence to show that, that that's probably not always the case. Um, so, so any input from the, the, the board and council on, on, on this uh, issue is, is definitely appreciated. Uh, and also too, I'll, um, if, if Tony Wood is able to uh, get his audio to work, if he wanted to you know, use this opportunity now to provide any clarification for the method that the Science Center uses for creating, for calculating uh, the, the discard estimates, uh, I'll uh, uh, offer that to him right now too. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes. Great. Sorry about the earlier issues. Um, I think both Matt and Katie did a job describing the differences. Um, the reason we use a different method for the stock assessment um, is because we want to use all of the data that's available to us, including those volunteer angler surveys and the ALS tag release data. Uh, in some years, we get thousands of measurements, which is valuable data for stock assessment, especially to inform uh, discard release sizes. At the last benchmark, uh, uh, an analysis comparing discard release sizes versus landed fish sizes show that the discards are actually much larger than landed fish, uh, which probably has to do with palatability issues for bluefish when they get really big. People don't tend to eat them, so they let them go. So in order to incorporate all this information to the, into the assessment, we convert those extra thousands of lengths into weights 
using length weight equations. Um, whereas for the emirate method, they're using the average weight of bluefish landed to represent their discard weights. Um, so that's why there's in some years there's a huge discrepancy between the two methods. Yeah, th thanks, Tony. Um, let's uh, so I'll go ahead and open it up for uh, comments from the board and council on on how to how to address discards. Jason McNamee, followed by Tony Delernia, and then followed yeah. by and then followed by Tom Fody and Justin Davis. Okay, uh, Jason. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, this this is a, a tough one. I, I think in general, uh, the Science Center method is more refined. I think can pick up on you know variability that that exists on a more you know a more refined scale. I, I have a lot more comfort that that's as as accurate as we can probably get with regard to this. Um, however, I also understand the you know the pragmatism of of the other approach. Um, but no matter like so, I guess my recommendation would be to to use the science center method. However, in the end, you end up with a disconnect because your accountability is going to be calculated potentially using a different method. So I, I don't know, I'm struggling to, to hone in on not understanding exactly how this will translate into um, accountability in the future if it syncs everything up to a single method um, and you know we can get the data in a, in a timely fashion in any given year. That's the other kind of hang up is collecting all of the the information from the disparate entities that are collecting it. So on its face, I would say I would prefer the sign center method. However, um, there's probably some um, pragmatic reasons why we might want to stick with the, the MREP method. So I, I don't know if Dustin or, or Matt want to speak to that at all. And, and I, I don't know if what I just said is helpful at all, um, other than I, I'm not sure I can get to a spot where I can just pick one o over the other and, and move forward. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Uh, if you don't mind, Chris, I'll take this one. Um, the allocations can be, the percentages in the SMP can be based on any data that the board and council deems fit. So if it's seems to be more appropriate to use the Science Center's approach for developing the percentages, that's a method that can be pushed forward or the MRIF method. Uh, however, when you're, you're right, when accounting and when GARFO is doing the catch accounting, we'll be using the MRIF method. Um, so perhaps there's you know, some inconsistency or disconnect if we base allocations based off of the Science Center method, but it's really at the, the discretion of the boarding council today. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dustin. Uh, next I have is uh, Tony Delarney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I understood Mr. Wood correctly, I just heard him say that the Science Center uh, is not as confident in the MRIP information or data that uh, compared to their own data and information so again i just like i just heard the science center say well you know what mrep may not be accurate uh if that's the case i'm going to like to approach apply that thinking and thought to a lot of other pieces of data that are come out of mrep Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And I don't know if the uh, if, if the issue is more that there's actual lengths of the released fish from the from the different volunteer angler surveys compared to uh, 
the MRIP uh, release information, which there are no links associated uh, with it. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to really resolve uh, uh, the differences between between the two. Uh, I mean, I have, I have concerns uh, w with both, quite frankly. Um, and this is probably one of the uh, tougher issues to tackle uh, moving forward, for sure. Uh, ne next up is, uh, oh, uh, so do you have a follow up, Tony? Well, yeah, I just, again, it's, you know, it's the, the science center saying, well, you know, I've got some MRIP data, but you know what, we're not going to go with that completely. We kind of like, don't like that. Maybe we'll substitute our own judgment for some of this. And if that's the new uh, set of guidelines that we're going to operate under, I, I've got another suggestions regarding MRIP myself. Let it go with that. Don't expect an answer, just an observation. Thank you. Chris Savage, John Hare has his hand up, as does Tony. Um, you may want to go to one of them to respond, perhaps. I lost you, Chris. Yeah, you can, you, can, you hear, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry about that. Um, it'll go with uh, go with John Hare and then then Tony, if that's okay, if that in that order, if that works. But go with Tony first, and then I'll follow up. All right, uh, that that that's that works for me. All right, uh, Tony, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I wasn't the the bluefish assessment doesn't. I wasn't commenting on the reliability of MRIP estimates because MRIP doesn't provide discard lengths. So I'm not sure how my comment got misconstrued that way. We use the best available information to us, and luckily. We have a lot of states that can provide information on those discard lengths. So for the landed fish weight, we use MRIP information. For the discard length information, we draw a variety of different surveys from a variety of different states. So I just wanted to clarify that and make sure that uh, my comments were not, they're not directed toward MRIP. They're just directed toward how we gather data for the assessment process. Th th yeah, thank you for that that clarification, Tony. Uh, uh, John Harris, uh, you want to follow up? Yeah, I just would like to reiterate Dr. Wood's you know response that it's not it's not uh, saying anything about the quality of MREP data. it's it's using all the data that's available to put together the best assessment uh, for Mid Atlantic Fisheries Management Council and ASNFC to, to make decisions. So it's using all the available information um, that's available. So thank you, Tony, for your clear answer. Uh, thanks, John. Um, next up is uh, Tom Foddy. Yeah, I have a. I'm looking at what you're using in like the American Little Society TAG program. Those are from people that mostly catch and release. So they're basically maybe targeting bigger fish. If you're going out to catch and eat, you're targeting smaller fish, so you'll, your discards will be a lot smaller. You know, we changed the whole fishery when we started putting bag limits, especially in, the, in a state like New Jersey, because what happened when you put 10 fish bag limits, the people that were coming from Pennsylvania, the people that were coming from church groups up north, that we used to come down and fill up their coolers with bluefish, to basically take home to eat, stop fishing. So we basically lost all the data for them. They basically didn't come because they weren't going to pay to go get 10 bluefish on a trip. So it basically redirected how we basically, the angles that we're fishing. And then when you start using volunteer surveys and American Literal Society, you're getting a different sector of the recreational sector fishery. And I don't know whether those numbers are, are minute compared to the overall recreational sector or not. But if you think about the amount of anglers that are in, say, in a state like New Jersey, and look at how many fill out the volunteer survey and how many are supposed to be, according to National Marine Fisheries Service, fishing in it, it's a very small percentage, and it's very, a very different section of the overall fishing body. So that's my concern when you start using those surveys to look like that and to calculate that, because you're putting strictly biases in them. So that's my concern. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I've got a two-part question. The, the first part is for Tony, and the question is whether 
peer review panels who have looked at the stock assessments that have used this Northeast Science Center method have had any reservations or comments about that method or whether they've actually had a chance to look at the two different methods and weigh in one way or the other. Uh, my second question is to staff and just to clarify the the input that you're looking for right now is just which discard method should we be using to estimate discards to inform catch based uh, allocation schemes for this issue. We're not making a decision about what method of discard estimation we're going to use going into the future for either stock assessments or, or specification setting. To the yeah, point um, that you this, this is Tony. Made. Regarding the peer review question, uh, peer reviewers have brought up some of the exact things that the last gentleman prior to you brought up. You know, there are inherent biases in, in these data sets, but through past working groups, uh, it's been decided that it's better to try and get an overall picture of discard length information than relying on the lengths of only landed fish, since analyses have shown that there are differences between the, the length distribution of landed fish and the length distribution of uh, discarded fish. So in the assessment process, we're just trying to get the best picture of that using the best available information. And yes, there are issues with it, um, but and they have been noted in past peer reviews, but the peer reviewers have also agreed with the working group that uh, we've done the best we can with the information available to best represent uh, those discards. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, and Dustin and Matt, I think uh, uh, Justin's second question was in terms of uh, just what, what you're looking for. For and, and Justin, I don't know if you want to re restate your question again for, for them. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I just wanted to clarify that the input that they're seeking right now is just what discard methodology we should use for developing catch based allocation schemes for this issue in the amendment. We're not talking about making a decision on what discard uh, methodology is going to be used going forward for stock assessments or specification setting in the future. That's correct. And this is Matt. I think it may be important to note here, um, you know, this simple decision of either using one approach or wanting to see both approaches. You know, if you, we were to use both approaches, that obviously will double the work that goes into the allocations here, which is fine. But you know, just want to make sure that that's uh, that that's understood. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And. Um... <laughs> Based on that, I probably should even ask this question, but I think just kind of think, thinking ahead because you know, this issue won't get resolved today. But has there been any discussion either by the Science Center or GARFO or the FMAT on, you know, so we have these two different methods. Uh, you know, they, they both have, um, I guess, caveats associated with them and uncertainty uh, of looking at what the, what the estimated discard weight would be like the average of the two, or is, is that just you know, adding uncertainty to uncertainty? I don't know if anyone had any thoughts on, on that option, if that's even been considered. This is Matt, I'll, I'll chime in. I don't believe that that has been considered. John okay. Hare has his hand up. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, John here. Yeah, we, uh, so the Science Center and the regional office, uh, it's been a topic of conversation at the Northeast Regional Coordinating Council um, for a couple of years, not specific to bluefish, um, but just in general in terms of the discards uh, using different methodologies. And we are working on a integrated catch accounting system um, but in this particular case, because it's sort of the weight estimates that are sort of being used, um, this would probably take a more specific, more focused effort on bluefish. But, you know, we can talk about it at the um, next NRCC meeting if uh, if the Mid-Atlantic Council or Atlantic States would, would look like to. Yeah, uh, yeah th th thanks for that, John. Um, any other input from the board and council on uh, the, the discard portion of this commercial recreation, rec recreational allocation issue? 
Mr. Chairman, we have um, Eric Reed, John McMurray, and I, I think Tony Delernia re-raised his hand, and I'm not sure if Tom Fody has re-raised his hand or not. Um, so that is your list. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll go to uh, Eric Reed, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, I have two questions, and honestly, I prefer the Science Center's methodology. I don't really want to get into whether or not MRIP is good or bad. I'm more than happy to do that later on today. <laughs> so I'm sure I'll look forward to that. But my, my first question is uh, for Mr. Wood, and uh, I just want to know if, if the results of the assessment would can change as it gets updated, since that was the first try with the the new MRIP data. And my second question is about what they use for uh, the length weight conversion. Is there any accounting for interseasonal variability in bluefish? I mean, you know, bluefish, they come up the coast in May and June that are 30 inches long weigh one thing. That same bluefish four months later is a much more substantial animal. You know, I don't know what the percentage change is, but I'd be interested to know if there's any sliding scale based on season. Thank you. So the, the second question, yes, we use a seasonal length weight relationship and apply it to seasonal lengths to cover that issue. And what was the first question again? Sorry, it's, uh, uh, do you ex the expect, you expect the results of the assessment might change as it gets updated since it was the first try with the new MRIP data? Uh, not not this year, because this year is we're just updating data, but during the next uh, management track update, yeah, the results the results will change. I'm not going to speculate on the direction, but I do anticipate they will change, as will the reference points. Uh, thanks, Tammy. Thanks, Eric. Uh, next up is uh, John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, from what I understand, the Science Center method is the more scientifically rigorous one, likely more accurate. Um, it's absolutely true that big fish get released and we keep the small ones. Very few people in this fishery keep big fish. And this appears to be a science question, not a management one. What is the best available science? That's what we should be required to use. We shouldn't pick the one that makes things easier. We should pick the right one. And at this point, it certainly appears that the Science Center method is the right one. Thanks. Th thanks, John. Um, and uh, Tony Delorney, did you have your hand up again uh, for, for, this, uh, for this issue? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Matt's looking for uh, guidance of uh, which method to use. He, he did say, though, that they could calculate using both methods, but that it would add uh, additional work. My question is, how much would this delay by doing both methods? I, I, the reason I answer that is because I would very much like to see what the difference in the results are using the two different methods. So, Matthew, can you give some advice if it will be delayed that much by going with both methods? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, Tony. Um, so if you recall uh, from, I believe it was the August meeting when we were last discussing the two different discard approaches, uh, there were definitely substantial differences. I think it was close to 4 million pounds between what the final recreational harvest limit would be. So there's, you know, there's a lot of discrepancy there, but in terms of time and the amount of work, um, you know, this will only be applied to the second issue. Uh, may be applied to the third issue, the commercial allocations to the states. Um, so whatever alternatives we decide to move forward with, you know, we've heard 10-year time series, five-year time series, a longer one, we would have those approaches and then also put in front of you the two different methods. So, you know, I don't think our timeline would be extended much at all for this. I, you know, I am confident that staff can get it done under the timeline that we do have now. So short answer, uh, it can be done. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I would recommend that we use the 10-year time series. I don't want to go back to 20 or 30 years. That's uh, 
something I don't have an advocated in summer plan. I haven't advocated in any of the other fisheries, so I'm not going to advocate it here either. So I'll use a 10-year timeline, and I would like to see both methods. I'm curious to see uh, uh, what the results would be, the difference in the results of the two methods. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Tony. And uh, and Matt, um, I don't know if this would be helpful or not as far as the analysis, uh, looking at the, the two different methods, because you know, as, as mentioned before, you know, the, the, the available length data uh, doesn't cover the whole range of, uh, of, of uh, bluefish. Uh, would it be helpful to I guess, show, I guess, where the B2s or which states the B2s are coming from uh, in, in those reference years to get an idea of you know, how, how much does the available length, the location of the length data align with just the overall B2s where they're being caught along the coast? Um, or is that just going to muddy up the water, add more time to what you guys need to do? That's a great question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it would definitely be informative. Uh, just to clarify, are you referring from MRIP or from these volunteer surveys or so i mean yeah we know we know where the volunteer um surveys uh i guess come from maybe maybe als it might be uh you know depending on you know the the state in which the the, the volunteer angler lives but um but what i was uh, asking for is just you know the, the b2 estimates from from the different states from emra um you know, to kind of see how that aligns with uh the location of the uh, the volunteer length uh, data that's uh, that's collected. Yeah, um, I'd be like I can't speak to if that will muddy up the waters yet, but I believe that the FMAC can prepare a table that can present that, and you know it'll be available for discussion. We can develop our alternatives for the next meeting as we plan. Have that available, uh, that table alongside, and then as we start to refine the alternatives over the following couple months, we can incorporate any other changes that are warranted. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, Tom Foe, did you have your hand up again for this uh, issue? Yes, I did. I'm looking at what Tony said, and I agree with one point that I want to see both. Unlike John McMurray, I don't trust whether the um, the Science Center is more scientifically right than the other by MREPs. When you ask people in, to face to face, when you basically do the intercepts, you're at least getting a person have to answer the question sitting standing in front of you. I don't know what. And again, it's not the different people that are in the volunteer surveys, which are basically a separate class altogether. So I don't know if that's the best scientific. I, you know, I I don't disagree with scientists. It's a good way of obtaining information, but I don't know whether it's best or not. Uh, and then the second thing, I disagree with Tony. I think we should look at the long term, just because history is an important part of this fishery, and I don't want to forget the history. And, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, Matt and Dustin, uh, did you get what you need from the board and council as far as moving forward on issue two? Yeah, it sounds like we'll be running both analyses. Uh, so just moving on to the next uh, number of action items, I think would be helpful since we've got a lot to get, lot to get through to uh, today. Yes, we, we do. And before we jump into issue three, uh, I'm, and I'm gonna try to save time for the public at the very end. However, uh, we did get a request from uh, Karen Bradbury from uh, Senator Whitehouse's office. Uh, she had a comment earlier about uh, the goals and objectives, and uh, you know, just in the interest of time, uh, I just want to go ahead and give uh, give give her the uh, the opportunity to comment uh, on 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 that issue right now before we jump into issue three. Karen. Your mic is unmuted now, and I don't know if you still wanted to make a comment, as Chris said. Karen, we cannot hear you. I'm not sure if you're trying to make a comment. If you still are trying to make a comment, maybe you could send us a chat in the questions box, and then if you still are, maybe we'll come back to you after we finish with issue three, Chris, because I'm not hearing her. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's the best approach, Tony. Thanks. So yeah, we'll we'll just go move on to issue three. Uh, so uh, Matt and Dustin, uh, yeah, pl please continue. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, there's a few other things that I think deserve the time to be addressed uh, just yet before I move on to issue three. Uh, namely, um, should other approaches be developed for consideration? Um, a trigger-based approach, as Matt discussed before, using socioeconomic data, or are there any other approaches um, that the FMAT should have looked into further? Oh, yeah, thanks, forgot about those. Uh, any, uh, any input from the board and council on, um, on, on these approaches for uh, the commercial recreational allocations? And Chris, in the interest of time, maybe the if there are any if there's anything that has been left out for issue two, um, board or council members could email Matt or Dustin those additional items, and we could just move on to issue three. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and this may come up again for uh, emailing items. So Matt and Dustin, if uh, if any board and council members uh, do that, what what uh, deadline would uh, would you like those comments? I believe as you know, as soon as possible would be appreciated. Um, but you know, today Wednesday of next week. I guess you know, by the end of the week would be great. Okay. Um, just official deadline, just in case you know it's a busy week for some people. We'll we'll say uh, Wednesday of next week. Uh, we'll give us okay, a little yes. bit of time. I, th I think that's more than fair. Yeah. So um, on on those last few items and anything else that comes up, we run out of time on. If uh, uh, and provide those comments to Dustin and Matt by close of business on Wednesday, May 13th. So all right, uh, issue three. So I'll I'll tackle this one here, um, and I think things will move a little bit more quickly now because some of these issues are related to things that we had already talked about. Um, so. Focusing on the commercial allocations to the states, we'd like some input again on the time series that should be considered. Uh, you know, I have my notes here going about different time series we've already talked about. I've heard that we like the 10 year, you know, as a good base reference. A five year time series is also very interesting because of the recalibration through MRIP, the new estimates. And then we also have some favor for the longer time series. So, you know, we can apply all of that here. So we have all of those opinions already in place. Um, if someone that made one of those comments would like to, you know, supplement that, please do. Um, again, the uh, any input on catch or landing space allocations, but similarly, we've heard to do both approaches already. Uh, again, the FMAT recommendation is to use a landing space allocation, which is what is already set in place through Amendment 1, um, so we can continue that. And then again, noting that the commercial discards are considered to be negligible in the stock assessment. Um, and so that's what we have for issue three. So thanks, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Matt. Um, any uh, any input from uh, the board and council on commercial allocations uh, that that issue? I do not see. Oh, Jason McMe has his hand raised. Uh, great, uh, uh, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm maybe just really. Um, Briefly, I, I would so the shorter time frame for the recreational piece. I think that the discussion about the recalibration is, um, you know, more important. That doesn't really come into play with the commercial side, but I still think there's relevance to a more recent period of time, just given there has been. You know, a lot of commercial activity to the to the north in, in recent years, I think, driven by um, climate uh, change. So I, you know, I I prefer a more recent and, and shorter time frame for the commercial allocation discussion as well. Uh, thank, thanks, Jay. Uh, any other comments? We have uh, David Borden and Tony Delernia. Okay, uh, David Borden. 
I can't hear anything. Is that specific to me or? No, uh, David, you were muted by us. I think try again, but you're right now you're muted by yourself. So try to unmute yourself and then see if you can talk, David. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I um, agree with what Jason uh, just offered in terms of using a, a recent time frame uh, because with the same logic, you know, landing is shifting. But I'd also point out that landings are going to shift regardless. They could go inshore, offshore. They could go north to south. Uh, so I think there would be merit in having another option in the document, which would be based on a composite of, of uh, two va uh, values. One would be the original landing uh, period of 81 through 89, use 50% of that value and then use 50% of the value uh, from the last 10 years. And the, the quick logic for using that would be that the stocks are moving, moving in unpredictable manners. Uh, and uh, the original uh, baseline, using the original baseline, some component of it, uh, kind of re uh, recognizes some of the historic investments in infrastructure that are made, uh, but also coupling it with the last 10 years would recognize the, uh, the stock shifts. So I think there's some logic in also having that be one of the options in the document. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, thanks. Similar uh, method that's been used uh, at times, uh, like in the South Atlantic Council, I think. Um, I need to learn it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to be consistent with my previous remarks, I would suggest that we use the uh, most recent 10 years. Uh, it, it's been said before, I'll say it again, and I keep, that's a theme that you hear constantly recurring for me. Climate change, having uh, management adapt to uh, what's offshore of their states at that at that time. That's what we're supposed to be doing as fishery managers. So I would stay with the uh, uh, most recent 10 years. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, anyone? Uh, else uh, with uh, input and comments on uh, on this issue? We have Joe Semino followed by Steve Hines. Hey, uh, Joe, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just quickly wanted to uh, put in some support for the option that David Borden just mentioned, uh, at least for us to get a chance to see that since it has, uh, it has provided a good balance for some other species, and I'll leave it at Thanks, Joe. Uh, Steve Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just don't see any utility in the further development of catch-based and allocation in the, as far as commercial fishery goes. So I'd recommend that be dropped. Okay. Uh, th thanks, Steve. Um, any any other uh, any more input on on this issue? Mr. Chairman, this is Matt Seeley, if, if I may. Um, I think that's a great point brought up by Mr. Hines about potentially dropping the catch-based approach here. So I, if we can get any more comment or input from any other council or board members on moving forward with potentially just one of the approaches, whether it's catch or landings, that would be great. Okay, yeah, is, uh, is, is there any objection from the board and council for removing the, the, the catch-based uh, allocations from the, for, for the commercial allocations? Um, and I guess, Tony, if there, anyone raises their hands. I do not see one, anyone raising their hand to object. Okay, th but thanks, Tony. Then, uh, uh, Chris, Jason McNeed did have his hand up previously, I think, to make a comment. Okay, uh, all right, so yeah, if there's uh, no objections to that, that gives uh, the FMAT a little more, um, a little more focus on, on, on this and one, one, one less uh, set of calculations. Uh, so yeah, I'll go back to uh, Jay McNamee. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just um, raising my hand to support what uh, Steve Hines said, so when you switched it up, I dropped my hand. Okay, good enough. Um, 
And, and um, Matt and Dustin, anything else you need uh, for, for this issue? No, I think um, I think that was some great guidance, and I think we're ready to move on to the transfers. And we're we're trying to move quickly here, so sorry everyone for going over. Oh uh, no, you're 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 doing great. There's there's a lot here to cover, um, and, and I appreciate the board and council providing some pretty pretty uh, thorough uh, input for for uh, for the FMAT. So yeah, issue four. Yeah, so we'll start with just the commercial state to state transfers. Uh, this one could be a simple. Uh, thing to move forward on. Uh, should this management tool be further developed? If so, how? Or do not adjust this provision given that uh, the majority of public comment has been in support of keeping this provision in the plan. Any comments on that would be, would be appreciated. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, any any uh, input from the board and council on commercial state to state transfers? You have uh, Jason McNee, David Borden, followed by Steve Hines. Okay, uh, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I don't have any um, issues. But I guess my my recommendation would be, you know, to further develop some potential uh, better ways of managing this. You know, right now it's just kind of a first come first serve type of a system and when there was a lot of fish available it seemed to work out you could find a state that hadn't been um, you know hit up for a quarter transfer and, and my fear is that you know that is not going to be the case for the foreseeable future and I don't know it just seems like not a great system where you're incentivized to just go out panhandling early just so you beat out the other states and it i think there could be a better system put in place um for this so I, i'd love for there to be some other options um so the state-to-state -state transfers it, it's a good thing it gives us um you know a lot of flexibility it's the mechanism for initiating that transfer. That's what I'm referring to. So some further development on some options, um, I think would be really valuable. And, and I'd be happy to not do that right now, but I could send something in to Matt and, and Dustin by way of some more detail on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful uh, for, for them. Uh, yeah, it is, it is a challenge uh, for, for the different states when it comes to uh, quota transfers. There's only so much uh, quota available uh, and sometimes not enough. And I think this year is definitely the case for, for that. Um, next up is uh, David Borden. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with Jason's suggestion, but at a, at a minimum, I, I would support uh, if we don't do that, I would support maintaining the existing system because it 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 works. Uh, it has worked, and the states collectively make good use of it. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Steve Hines. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I agree completely with what was just said. Um, especially, let's find a way can better manage this. Having been the receiver of many, many transfers, I can tell you that it is a real challenge. And I have always thought that if we had some sort of a neutral referee for this, maybe an ASMSC staff, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go there, but whatever, some kind of a way of better managing this, that that quota could be better utilized among the states that request transfers. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, any other, any more input from the board and council on commercial state to state transfers? Yes, Sunny Gwen. Uh, thanks, uh, Sunny. Sunny's muted, self-muted. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, for state to state transfers. I, I support it. We've uh, we've transferred Manhattan. Maryland has. Uh, we just recently did dogfish. 
I believe to Virginia, and I know we've done bluefish too, but um, I firmly believe that we don't want to give up these fish because it is an economic opportunity for commercial fishermen in our state. And if we give up these fish and reallocate them, well, that economic opportunity is gone. There's no fish to be had, and it gives the it doesn't give the commercial fishermen a chance to to go out and work on something. And our state seems to be getting less and less every year, and and we still need that economic opportunity. So I'm I'm a definitely a supporter of state to state transfers. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sonny. Uh, there's any any uh, more comment uh, on this? Uh, uh, if if not. Um, is there any other input you're looking for, uh, Matt and Dustin, for, for this issue? Sounds like Jason will be following up with some ideas on how this could be revised. I would just encourage uh, other members to either work with Jason, maybe David Borden, and um, or or to come up with additional ideas if you don't have them at the moment um, to get those ideas emailed in to Matt and I before Wednesday. Um, so it sounds like we'll be keeping this in um but potentially looking at a better system for how transfers are initiated and allocated to different states okay great uh yes i guess move on to the next uh portion of this if uh, if you're ready unless there's someone else had a uh, comment on the state to state transfers chris uh, maureen davidson did have her hand up and then um steve hines just so you know your hand is still up and you're not muted via the webinar Maybe you're muted on your phone. Okay, yeah, thanks. So before we go to uh, the sector transfer, uh, I'll go to uh, Maureen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I sort of just wanted to add that transfers are important. Uh, they do allow a resource to be used by those that are in the position to use it, and it does benefit the commercial fishermen. And so New York State would like to see, we'd like to see it continue uh, if, if there can be a means to improve how we do it so that it can be managed better. Um, I would support that also, but I just really wanted to say on the record that uh, transfers are important for our commercial fishermen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Maureen. All right, uh, yeah, Dustin and Matt, we'll move on to the sector transfer part of issue four. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, we're we're looking. The FMAT is looking for guidance on um, whether this should be uh, developed further. Um, some potential modifications that the FMAT identified were, you know, should we uh, look into potential policies on allowing or preventing transfers? Uh, maybe the board and council will have decisions there. Um, should the the transfer cap um, be reanalyzed? Um, and uh, whether there should be considerations for a bi-directional transfer, should the FMAT develop something in, in that regard. And then a helpful advice is also, if anything, should just be less status quo. So thank you. Hey, uh, thanks, Dustin. So uh, yeah, uh, comments uh, and input from the board and council for the sector transfers. You have Tony Delarnia. And thanks, uh, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would uh, recommend that we consider now looking at bi-directional sector transfer. I think that's a tool that we may find to be useful, not just in the bluefish fishery, but also in other fisheries that have significant recreational and commercial components in them. So that should be a policy. I'd like to look at it now here uh, with uh, the possibility of applying that process towards uh, different fisheries in the future. As far as the uh, transfer cap of 10.5 million pounds is concerned, I was part of the council when we came up with that number. I'm still very comfortable with that number. And um, again, if there's going to be excess recreational quota in the water, I have no problems with transferring it to the commercial side. Again, must be excess recreational quota. And I think a 10.5 million pounds cap is, uh, I think, I don't think we've ever used it if we, or if we just most recently used it. but. Uh, uh, those are my two comments. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, any anyone else with comments? We have Nicola Meserve and 
Um, and then followed by Roy Miller after Nicola. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nicola? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a follow up on uh, Mr. Delernia's comment about uh, looking at uh, bi directional transfers. And then I also wanted to ask um, how the 10.5 million pounds was selected and whether at that time or now um, consideration should be given to uh, that being based on a percentage of the um, of the allowed harvest as opposed to you know a set number which makes a is very different depending on what what the the allowed harvest is for that for a sector in any given year. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. So, uh, Matt or Dustin, do you have any background on the, the basis for the 10.5 million pound cap that was set in Amendment 1? I'm afraid I don't. Um, this I, is Matt. Okay, go ahead, Matt. <laughs> I was going to say, due to Dustin's silence, I'm thinking that we're probably both in the same boat here. Um, I'm not sure where the 10.5 million exactly came from. Um, I'm happy to take a look back at Amendment 1, though, in detail, and Nicola can follow up with you on that. I'm wondering also if Tony Delernia might have some input there since he indicates that he was part of that decision-making process. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. I think you look at the, you know, the landings probably when, when that was, uh, when Amendment 1 was was done, the commercial bluefish landings were, were higher. But, uh, um, I mean, that's something where, I mean, I guess if you wanted to come back to us when if, if that's if this is an important thing to to cover or, or if Tony has some Tony Delaney has something real quick to, to add since yeah, he was Kevin, I, it. Just, yeah. uh, that at the time it was a uh, uh, basically a percentage I think Nicola uh, made a very good uh, suggestion regarding the uh, percentage of the total quota I think we should go back and look and see uh, that 10.5 million if I remember correctly was a certain percentage of uh, what was in effect at that time. Let's take a look at that percentage and apply it uh, towards uh, future catches. So I think uh, Nicola made a very good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks for that uh, clarification, Tony. Uh, next up is Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wonder if we should be a bit cautious about um, allowing transfers for a stock that is experiencing overfishing and is currently overfished. Um, there would be some conservation benefit when those conditions exist from not transferring. In other words, having uh, less than allowable landing. So I, I just throw that out there for consideration. It is something that I recall hearing in one of our public hearings as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Roy. Uh, any any other board or council members with uh, input or comments on sector transfers? We have, um, I, I think that's everybody. And Roy Miller, your mic is still on if you want to mute it, please. I don't, Tony Delernia, I think your hand is up from before, correct? You want to put it down? Yep, it was. You can move on to the next issue. All right, great. Thanks, Tony. So, yeah, uh, on to issue five, the rebuilding plan. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, you all have seen the initial projections that we've put out there, and they haven't been completed yet. Once they are completed, they'll be incorporated into the next SMAT meeting summary. Um, that meeting is scheduled for a few weeks from now, so they'll be available then. Uh, but the FMAT is curious if, you know, outside of what we do have available here, are there any other projections that you're interested in us exploring further? And then the other main point is, um, what are we doing with the rebuilding plan? Again, the FMAT recommendation is to remove it. However, the staff highly recommends leaving it in due to the variety of reasons already explained. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, thanks, Matt. So, yeah, um, uh, board and council have any input on any other on the options for rebuilding? Any alternative options? And this may be an opportunity where, um, you know, after this meeting, if, uh, if if any board or council members want to provide input to Matt and Dustin on, on maybe some other projections, but also importantly, the uh, the, the question of uh, you know, whether to uh, 
uh, addressed through a building plan in this amendment or a separate action. So uh, I'll open it up to council and board members for input on those items. Jason McNamee has his hand up. Okay, thanks, uh, Jason. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and um, so I'm wondering, we've got these uh, projection scenarios here. I think it's a good, good set of projections. I'm wondering if they're keeping, if there are any changes to how they're dealing with, you know, like the recruitment assumption, any of those things in the in the projections. And so I'm not sure if that's a question for Dustin or Matt or maybe even uh, Dr. Wood. Um, but that that's my question. Like, I think these are all good. I wonder if they have any uh, alternative assumptions for recruitment. Um, my assumption is they're using, you know, sampling from the entire um, time series. So I'm, I'm wondering if they could do like a shorter um, time series and, and kind of use those on the projections as as well. Um, and if I'm out of line, I, I'm not sure if this is the right place for that kind of discussion. Uh, you could tell me that too. Um, yeah, I don't know, Dustin or Matt, do you have uh, an answer to that or if that's something that uh, Dr. Wood can quickly answer as far as how, how that's handled in these projections? Yeah, I can so add, I'll, I can I'll just jump into that. Um, oh. This is Anthony Wood. Um, we are sampling, like you said, Jason, from the entire recruitment time series. And yeah, I would have to rerun projections, but I can I can specify any time series to sample from. Yeah, uh, yeah, th th thanks for that. Um, any any Matt, do you have anything to add to that, or is that pretty much cover that, the question that, that Jason asked? I think uh, Dr. Wood is the best one to answer that question. So I think that's, uh, I think that was great. All right, great. Um, any, any other input on, uh, on this issue from the, from the board and council? Uh, a quick uh, interjection. Sorry, uh, Chris, <laughs> can't raise my hand. So I have to just interrupt sometimes, but um, I'm wondering if uh, Jason McNamee would be able to expand upon a suggestion, or maybe maybe the best case would be him just emailing some ideas. Um, uh, but it sounds like Tony Wood can look at a variety of different recruitment averages over time, and maybe more direction would be helpful. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe, yeah. Um, I don't know, Jason, if you have any thoughts on that right now, or would you just rather uh, uh, email Dustin and Matt with your ideas after that, or any other additional questions and um, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you right now. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I, you know, I could sort of pick an arbitrary number. Um, I, I guess maybe what I can, I don't know if this is appropriate. I, you know, if there's no reason to do something like that, if recruitment doesn't seem to be different more recently than it was in the past um, or anything like that, then I don't see the need to make anyone do any extra work. But if there if there are differences, um, I think it's it's worth an investigation of a shorter time period, like the last. And, and here I am making an uh, ad hoc, just throwing an ad hoc number out, but the last 10 years or, or something um, like that. So I, I'm happy to take that offline, but I don't want to do anything inappropriate, like to have them come forward with some. Uh, projection scenario that the rest of the board and council didn't have a chance to weigh in on. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Jason. Um, any other comments or input on issue five? Sorry, I was muted. Hannah Hart and Joe Cimino. And thanks. Uh, Hannah? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just kind of want to put this out there that um, given the status of the stock and the strict timeline that we're on, 
Um, I would kind of side with the FMAT to recommend pulling the rebuilding plan out of the amendment. Um, I'd also like to note that the majority of the comments are pushing for status quo in the first few issues. So given that with some of the disbelief in the MRF estimates that, you know, maybe it's time to focus on the rebuilding plan and kind of keep working on the other issues, but take our time working through them. Uh, th thanks, Hannah. Uh, Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've, I've already said it once, but I, I strongly support re, uh, removing the rebuilding plan and moving that forward first. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, this may be um, I have a question for for for, for Matt. Um, but if if we didn't if we didn't remove it today, and we came back in June after the FMAT. Uh, you know, met after this meeting and saw that you know the, the the timeline for getting this all done within two years is uh is is probably not gonna not gonna work uh we would have the opportunity to separate out the rebuilding plan at our june meeting is that is that correct yeah thank you for that question mr chairman that's correct um you know as of now as i've mentioned before our timeline is set we are you know, working to meet that timeline. Um, and, you know, we can review this process as we continue along. It can be removed at a later date, put into a separate action, and still completed within the two-year timeline. Um, so I, I personally think that um, as we're going through this, that it may be a little bit too early to remove. Um, however, um, you know, it's up to the council and board for a decision. But I just want to, again, reemphasize that our Timeline is very strict, and we are following along with it as it's been presented. So, thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. Um, okay, any any other thoughts on on that point as far as uh, whether to uh, re in continue to include the rebuilding plan in this amendment uh, or uh, or remove it today? I've heard two um, two comments as far about removing it today, but you know, we have other options uh, later on. This isn't the last. Uh, the, the last opportunity to do this. So uh, lo looking for a little more comment um, on which direction uh, uh, the FMAT should go uh, for the rebuilding plan of this amendment. Chris, you have uh, Nicola Meserve and then Emerson Hasbrook. Okay, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would support the approach of, of keeping them together for now. Um, let the FMAT leave this meeting with its new instructions and come back to uh, the board and council with a um, you know, their thoughts on whether they can continue to work on, on the same timeline for, for both things. Um, there are some issues in the, you know, the initial amendment, uh, state by state commercial allocations that have been a long standing uh, issues that, that certain states have wanted to address. So I don't want to, see, I wouldn't like to see, you know, those issues get bumped unless it's necessary to meet the timeline for rebuilding separately. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Nicola. Uh, Emerson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to see them uh, continue together for the time being, um, although what concerns me is that I've heard several times today that we're under a, a real tight timeline for this process, which I think is probably based on um, initiating the rebuilding plan. Um, and I think that we're going to need more time for discussion about the allocation issues. But for now, um, let's move them. Uh, let's move both of these components together and then separate them out uh, this summer if we need to. Hey, thanks, Emerson. Um, I've heard our, uh, your arguments for, for both options. I guess is there any objection by the council and board to leave the rebuilding plan in the amendment for now we will definitely revisit this in june and probably have a better idea as far as whether the timing works and we can take this up in june uh, to decide whether it's best to, to take it out is there is there any objection to going with that option Chris, I, I'm not sure. Um, Joe Semino and Emerson both have their hand raised, but I think that their hands have, they've been raised for a while. Joe took his down. 
and Emerson has taken his down. So I don't see any hands raised. Um, and Sheree Patterson did have her hand up earlier to comment as a FYI. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, yeah, I'll go to uh, Sheree Patterson. Sheree, you are self-muted, so you just need to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. Um, yes, I was just going to indicate I would prefer to see them together uh, a little bit while longer, but the minute you said that uh, you were looking for opposition from that, I took my hand down. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Sheree. So yeah, um, I guess we'll just uh, we'll we'll see we'll see where we are in June. Um, uh, on this and, and and leave it in for now. So, uh, so Dustin, Matt, I guess you're ready to move on to issue six. Right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, and there are a, a few um, other issues that we want to examine. This one might be very simple. Um, so the FBAT recommends further development of sector specific management uncertainty. We showed a, a draft chart, flow chart of what that might look like. Um, and so, Basically, we're just looking for guidance. Should this be considered further or should it be dropped out? And if there's like a drastic change that should be considered that isn't evident in the flow chart, um, what consideration would that be? Okay, thanks, Dustin. Uh, any, uh, any comment from the uh, board and council on uh, how to address uh, recreational and commercial management uncertainty? We have Eric Reed followed by Emerson Hasbrook. Thanks, uh, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I prefer to have them separate. Just like a, what I'm looking at right here, I prefer that. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Emerson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also prefer uh, to see the uh, uncertainty split um, as is shown um, in the slide that we're looking at right now. Thank you. Okay, th th thanks, Emerson. Any objection to uh, to the approach shown up on the on the screen right now? I don't see. Well, we have one Mid Atlantic Council staff member that has his hand raised. Um, Jose Mon. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, Jose. Uh, but he is not connected via audio, so that actually won't work. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, if there's no objections to, to this, uh, I guess um, uh, Matt and Dustin, uh, get the direction you need for for this for this item under issue six. Thanks, Matt. Can you go to the next? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so for this one, uh, we're asking if um, for higher sector separation should be considered further. And on top of that, um, should both a sub ACL option as well as a potential policy, while not a specific allocation, um, maybe a policy for different measures be considered. And Dustin, That's if I may so. just add on to that again. Um, just to emphasize the fact that these policy changes and things that we're kind of referencing, depending on the degree of what sort of change, a lot of these management measures that we are allowed to put into place can address uh, this different management option. You know, we have different bag limits that can be imposed and there's different measures that are in place for the for hire as opposed to the private angler. So that's something that can be continued to be revised over time as we get more information from the stock assessment updates and things like that. So um, just please keep that in mind as you think about this action moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that clarification, Matt. So basically, you know, through specifications, we can have different regulations for the private anglers and for higher anglers like we're doing now um, uh, without having to go through the amendment. But if we wanted to have actual sector allocations for the for higher sector, that would uh, have to go through this amendment. Is, is, am I understanding that correctly? Yep, that's exactly right. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, great, thanks. So, uh, any any uh, input from uh, from the board and the council on uh, sector separation? You have Adam, then Jason, then Emerson, then Tony, then Doug Haymans. Okay, long long list. I'll probably have to ask again after Adam, but we will start with uh, Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to speak against continued development of separate allocations. Uh, that recommendation is based on a number of factors. Number one is the high degree of MRIP uncertainty that we currently have that has led us to this rebuilding time. Uh, we're basing something on a very recent change and to go ahead and make what would be another significant change I think uh, would be very concerning. Uh, secondly, based on the very low percentage numbers we see to that allocation could be considered right now. I would be very concerned about the implications that that could have on the operation of the for hire sector with numbers that would potentially be so extremely low. Uh, third, I think we have something in place that we're working on with regards to separate measures. Uh, I would encourage some additional guidance from the FMAD in this process on ideas on how we could further codify what we're already doing through specification. Uh, and if there is any management recommendation that comes out of that, either through the amendment process uh, or a recommendation for a different management document venue, such as a framework or addendum, uh, I think that would be worthwhile for the FMAT to consider uh, as they move forward with this work. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, Tony, who, who do we have next on the list? I think the order I gave you was Jason, Emerson, Tony Delernia, and then Doug Hamans. Okay, uh, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this would be um, counter to what uh, Commissioner Milosky just offered. So I, I'm, I fully support continuing to uh, develop to pursue this further. I think there were some good options in there. Um, I, you know, I think most folks are most concerned about setting a quota-like um, allocation for this sector, but it doesn't have to be that way. And a sub-ACL was one of the ways it was characterized in the document, and I, I think that's a, a good approach. So I, I fully support um, continuing to develop some of these for higher sector separation um, options. I think it's imperative uh, for this industry that we start looking uh, at them differently than we look at the general recreational fishery for a lot of different reasons. And so I'd, I'd like to see this uh, pursued further. Hey, uh, th thanks, Jason. Uh, next up is Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would suggest that we uh, uh, keep the uh, the four higher sector separation um, included in this. Um, let's see um, uh, what, what options get developed, and then uh, let's hear what the public has to say about it. So let's keep it in. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Emerson. Uh, Tony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with everything Adam said on this issue when he first uh, he was first to speak. I agree with everything he said. At the same time, I think uh, it will be help useful to keep this in because uh, at least in New York, I keep hearing, and I'm sure in other states, uh, they look at, uh, we want sector separation, we want sector separation. Much of that is driven by what they saw occur in the Gulf of Mexico and the sector separation uh, process there. I think uh, once they see what they would actually get in the sector separation scenario, they may change their tune. But the only way we're going to do that is if we run through the, uh, jump through the hoops that's necessary to come up with the numbers. And so while I uh, agree with everything Adam said, I would still keep it there until to get the final product to let those that have been asking for separation to see what they actually get. You know, the quote the old proverb, be careful what you're asking for, you may just get it. And I think that would apply to this case. Thank you. 
Doug Hammonds. So I had taken my hand down because I agreed with everything that Adam said, but seeing as how Tony just did, but went the opposite way, uh, I would agree with Adam to remove it from this action. Um, leave it there. Okay, thanks, Doug. Um, any other comments on uh, how to handle the for hire sector separation? Uh, definitely have a uh, kind of di different opinions on on this at this point. I have my hand raised, Tom Fody. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm getting back to you. the The order that I have here is Tom, then Justin, then Joe, and then Emerson has his hand back up again. I don't know if that is on purpose or carryover. Okay, we'll we'll go with uh, Tom, Justin, and Joe for now. So start off with uh, with Tom Fuddy. I understand where Adam's coming from, but I agree with Tony. We should be to, to be transparent. And there was a lot of discussion in New Jersey about fair and equitable, how this basically came about. Um, and I think we should go through and show exactly what the allowance would be. I think we need to do all the data to basically be transparent to the record because I caught a lot of flack on this. And there was no, it did not go to public hearings. And, uh, you know, it was done by the council, mostly surprising all of us about the, the suggestion when it came in. So uh, I think we need to go out with everything. And I, that's why I agree with Tony and what Tony Delano said. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Justin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. I, I just want to speak in favor of keeping this in for now and working on it further. I agree with you know what emerson and tom and tony said is that there's there's definitely a lot of interest in this uh, from the for hire sector uh, i think given that we should keep it in develop it a little further it sounds like a simple concept but when you start really thinking about it and how to actually implement it it could be incredibly tricky to do and i think it really just would be in our best interest to flesh this out a little bit and then put those different types of options and approaches out there in front of the for hire sector and the public at large and get further feedback. So I'm in favor of keeping it in. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Joe Smina? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just ditto what Tony said. I, I, I share Adam's concerns, um, but I think it needs to stay in for now. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, I guess, is there any objection to keeping it in for now not that you know we're looking you know whether we support sector separation but to at least include it in the uh in, in, among the issues um based on the comments uh we've received uh today um i see justin davis and emerson had their hands up from before i don't know if that was on purpose and then Adam did raise his hand to object. Okay. Um, so Adam, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll let you go ahead and speak on this again. Um, yeah, this, I'll let you go ahead and speak on this again. So I'm I'm not going to attempt to force a motion on this at this point. Uh, what I I there are certainly merits of leaving it in from a transparency perspective, from helping complete the administrative record and consideration of this topic. I think what I would ask for would be some uh, directive that if there is a need to focus on one aspect of this or another that priority be given towards consideration of fine tuning what we're doing now uh, with regards to uh, different measures by mode uh, and that be a priority that comes out of this however allow uh, some continued development again to address I acknowledge that there are members of the public that are interested in this. Uh, I, my concerns remain. Uh, if I had to make a final vote on this today, I would be opposed to it. Sounds like I would not be alone in that position. But I, I don't want to push this to any motion today. I do think there's some merits and some further looking at it. Uh, but I wouldn't want it to cause pushback on anything else or loss of some more effort on fine tuning what we're doing on a specifications process. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that, Adam. Um, 
Dustin and Matt, do you have the, do you get the input that you need for, uh, for, for sector separation uh, or, or do you need a little more guidance from the board and council at this point? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so it sounds like we'll be developing this further with the FMAT. Um, uh, possibly a little bit more guidance on should all different types of allocations be considered or should one specific type of allocation be considered? And the options that the FMAT and staff have put together um, is there's, of course, the landings based allocation um, in MRIP, it's A1s plus, or A's plus B1. There's the uh, catch based allocation, which is A plus B1 plus B2, B2 being all live releases. So that's um, possibly the biggest look at an allocation. And then the alternative to that is A plus B1 and then B2 times the 15% mortality ratio. So that's landings plus dead discards. Now the FMAT can look at all these three different types of allocations. Um, it might thoroughly complicate the issue, or if the board and council have any guidance today, we could pursue one or two of these different options. Hey, thanks, Dustin. Yeah, I think the, you know, the, the, the list of things for the FMAT is, is already getting pretty long. So I, if, you know, and is there any, I guess, is there any uh, thoughts uh, from the council and board on winnowing down these options for how to look at allocations or uh, is the board and council comfortable with the FMAT analyzing all of them? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Emerson Hasbrook has his hand up, and if there's not um, some specifics, maybe folks could email, again, Dustin and Matt, the, the specific ways they would like them to review, um, and maybe that would help eliminate some. But Emerson just took his hand down, so I'm not sure. Maybe he didn't need to talk. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, so yeah, yeah b based on Tony's uh, uh, suggestion there. I guess, uh, you know, also in the interest of time, uh, you know, if there's any input that the board and council want to provide uh, Dustin and Matt on on how to, to look at this, unless there's any uh, specific thoughts on that right now. Uh, if not, um, uh, I'll ask uh, Dustin and Matt to move on to uh, any other issues under issue six that uh, they need input from, uh, for, on us from. And I don't see any hands raised. All right, thanks. Uh, anything else for issue six? Uh, Doug Heyman has you, his hand up. Hey, Doug. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I sincerely am sad that we've gotten to 110 for me to get to the one issue I'm really interested in. But in the interest of time, uh, Georgia is very interested in having this plan consider uh, adding a recreational component to de minimis. Uh, I'm prepared with the motion if you would like that, if needed. Otherwise, um, I'd like for us to consider adding recreational de minimis into the blue fish pan. Hey, thanks, Doug. Uh, I guess quick, quick question I have uh, for, for, I guess, both ASMFC and, and council staff is it, this is a joint plan how how if we decided to uh, include an option for recreational de minimis status, uh, how would that work since de minimis is really just on the uh, ASMFC side of this FMP? I did a little bit, this is Dustin speaking, um, I did a little bit of checking around with um, GARFO staff and council staff. Um, as you alluded to uh, in the federal plans, uh, de minimis um, has not really been incorporated. Um, it's been put forward before in a couple other plans. Actually, it was brought up in Amendment 1 for Bluefish. Um, it does complicate the issue, but I don't think there's any rule specifically prohibiting the use of de minimis in a federal plan. And I'll let others weigh in on that if they want to elaborate. Yeah, this is Matt. I think I can add a little bit there. I, I do believe that it is okay and it can be added in. Um, and I think uh, that it can be actually a commission only alternative as well. Uh, but if 
if you know if that's not right correct guidance please someone uh, chime in there but I do believe that is uh, correct and thanks any any other um, input or clarification on how de minimis would work um, and if not um, I, I'll look for any uh, uh, thoughts from the board and council on including uh, the, this issue in the amendment I think Doug has a follow-up and then we have Hannah Hart on deck. Okay, uh, Doug. Thank you. And that's yeah, that's part of why I would like to have it in so I can get a, a complete and thorough explanation of whether or not it's allowed through the council process or not. Um, yeah. Okay, hey, thanks, Doug. Uh, Hannah? So mine is more of a question than related to this. Do you want me to hold off for now? Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and just uh, handle the, the the question of uh, de minimis for now, um, and we, we can we can come back uh, to you after that. If that's okay. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess uh, just to speed things up, is there any objection uh, from the council and board on the FMAT? Uh, exploring the possibility of uh, of recreational de minimis uh, in, in this amendment. I do not see any hands raised. Okay. Uh, all right. Great. Yeah. Thanks. So we'll uh, I guess that'll uh, be be something for the uh, FMAT to consider. Um, Dustin and actually uh, before I go back to Dustin and Matt, I'll I'll go back to Hannah. Uh, she had a, she had a question on something else. Yeah, thank you. So I'm curious, has the council or board ever discussed maybe handing management over to ASMFC? Um, I know the South Atlantic Council did this with Cobia, and I'm just curious if we were to discuss that or anything, would that allow more flexibility with management um, and what that might look like? Or if that is even something of interest from this body? I don't ever recall the question coming up on for, for bluefish, but I'll uh, I'll open up for uh, either council staff or GARPA or whoever um, if they have a, an answer for, for for Hannah on that. You don't have any GARPA hands up, but Tony Delernia does have his hand up. Okay, Tony. Thank Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This uh, issue, this request, actually came to the council in the mid-90s during the Clinton administration when there was a desire to reduce the number of uh, federal regulations on the books. And there was a, uh, a request at that time to the council to consider uh, council withdrawing management of bluefish and turning it all over to ASMFC. And uh, because at that time, a lot of it was still occurring in federal waters, the council decided against that. Uh, so it had been discussed, again, it was mid-90s, I would say maybe 96, 97, and the council at that time decided to maintain and keep the management of bluefish. Uh, that's the last time I heard it was ever discussed. Thank you. And, uh, th thanks, Tony. Um, okay, Dustin and Matt, anything else for the other issues? Have are there? I can't remember if there's any others, or did we uh, cover all the ones that uh, F Matt wanted input on? Uh, we, so I, I do believe that we, yeah, I, I do believe we've covered everything. I just would request that, um, you know, in the essence of time, if any commissioners or council members do have input on how they would like to see the for higher sector separation allocations based on either landings or catch, if they do, please reach out to us. It's an important topic that'll help guide development. Um, but I think that's it from my end. Dustin, if there's anything else to add. Yeah, I'll say this is what the FMAT and staff prepared based on public feedback. Um, you know, it certainly doesn't preclude any any other items being added onto this amendment, but as we can see, it's already quite a robust amendment. But if if there are additional considerations that are very important for a board of council members to include, um, we encourage you to email us um, within the next week. Okay, thanks. And uh, yeah, I guess just, you know, real quick, is there any, any items that we haven't discussed today that any board and council members right now have, would, would like the FMAT to consider?
I don't see any hands up from commissioners. I will tell you that we did have a couple of public comment requests throughout going through the issues. Okay, thanks. Um, I know we still have other business, but I know the public has been waiting very patiently on that. Um, so I guess we'll, I'll open it up for public comment. We're gonna have to keep it pretty brief, uh, 60 seconds uh, for, for comments. Uh, Tony, is there any uh, public that are still interested in uh, providing some comment? I would ask the public that had previously reached out to use the raise your hand function to comment. Um, to do that, you just need to make sure the little hand, your hand will be raised when the red arrow is pointing down and Greg DiDomenico has his hand up, so I'm, I will unmute him. Hey, Greg, Greg, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. One quick question. If catch based uh, uh, if a catch-based approach is going to remain in this amendment or addendum, um, if it finds its way uh, to be implemented in Bluefish, is catch-based management going to be considered in Black Sea Bass, Scup, and Fluke? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg, and I guess we'll talk about that this afternoon or later this afternoon. Uh, any other public with uh, comments? I don't see anybody else who is raising their hand. Okay, thanks. So uh, if there's no other public comment, uh, I'll then bring it back to the board and council to see if there's any other business that needs to be discussed today. Okay, uh, Chris, I'm sorry. I did just get a text from the folks who are managing the question box, and they are saying that previously Chris Ledford had asked to speak, so I'm going to unmute Chris. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. getting some feedback on Chris's line. I've muted him now. It sounds like he was on another call, so maybe we can uh, come back to him. All right, the other person, Chris, was um, Jason Jarvis. Let me just get down to him. I am not seeing him on the webinar anymore. Katie, do you see him? No. Okay, so the only other person was, um, it was just the uh, Mr. Ludford. Okay, um, yeah, and I apologize to the public for having to wait, but you know, as you saw and heard today, that you know a lot, a lot to cover uh, in order for the FMAT to, to move forward on this. So, um, anyways, so yeah, I'll just uh, bring it back. Unless uh, the the public comes in here in the next few seconds, I'll. Uh, Bring back to the board and council to see if there's any other business uh, they, they have uh, for the Bluefish board today. I don't okay, see hearing any none. Hands up. All right, yeah, thanks. So hearing none, uh, uh, see Matt and Dustin have uh, the next steps. Uh, uh, slide up as far as the timeline goes. I don't know if you wanted to add, Matt or Dustin, if you wanted to add anything uh, to this before uh, we, we adjourn. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to put this up just for people to reference uh, one last time. And I just want to say thank you very, very much to all the, uh, everyone on the call, council and commission members, especially. This was extremely productive. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but we, um, you know, we're looking forward to going through it. So thank you everyone so much for all of your input. Yeah, yeah, thank you uh, to, to you, Matt and, and Dustin for uh, you know, walking us through all of this. And uh, yeah, thank the, uh, the board and council for, uh, 
for for all the input that uh, you provided uh, them today, so the so the FMAC can move forward. As you see, the timeline's pretty tight, and we're gonna be pretty busy uh, when it comes to bluefish. We'll be talking about this a lot, um, uh, but look forward to uh, the progress they they make on that. And and of course, uh, uh, many thanks to the ASMFC staff for uh, keeping this uh, keeping the the webinar moving along in a good or smoothly and keep me from going off the rails. I'm sorry it took so long, uh, but I think we've got a lot of good work done today. So uh, unless there's any objections, uh, uh, I will go ahead and, and adjourn the meeting. Uh, thanks, everyone.